Good morning, everyone. We welcome you at Mir Zet University, at Muwatan uh, Institute for Democracy and Human Rights. This is the second this is day our second of the conference. Uh, conference and um, we and will... this is the third session, our conference, and... the political uh, economy for hegemony and liberation in Palestine. Today's session. It's, it is the economy of Palestine. So we were we are going to have Uh, it's it's uh, a rich uh, session. This uh, and it's for a uh, central uh, uh, reason and the ideological uh, trend in studying economics and how to reconsider economic uh, topics, whether in Palestine or elsewhere in the world, uh, as a, a economy is a technical uh, issue and a cognitive uh, objective um, 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 topic away from politics. So in this conference, we are trying, it's an attempt to try to go back to the uh, social, uh, to, to uh, take economy to the social roots and the importance uh, of, the, of this uh, session and this conference stems from our attempt to dismantle the uh, hegemony of the ideology of market as a social uh, system that is not com uh, complete, or but it's one of the systems, uh, social systems that have been organized throughout the societies. Uh, therefore, it might, there might be a, a need to uh, overcome it, to uh, disfragment it, or to fragment it, and to identify the uh, factors of hegemony in it, uh, in it, and the strengths in it. Uh, the, um, in, in this session, I think it's important to know the relationship between the ideology of the market and in Palestine and uh, a, along with the uh, a, a colonizing um, context we live in, uh, 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 please allow me to, uh, to introduce um, the, uh, the speakers of today. Um, with, uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Tamimi is the Director General of Hydrologic, uh, Palestinian Hydrologists, uh, uh, lecturer in, uh, in uh, Al-Quds University uh, for Development Sustainability, um, and uh, Mr. Jamin, uh, uh, Brazil University instructor in biochemistry, and Ben Arka, who is the academic uh, committee in financial studies at Brazil University. And, and this is a brief of Sam Ben Munir. El Far is also academic member in the uh, finance uh, financial and Banking Studies at Music University. I, I welcome uh, them and we'll start with uh, Dr. Jamil Harb uh, as our first speaker uh, in today's speech. Um, uh, just um, so please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to go uh, against the try. I'm going to discuss the food system in Palestine. It's a complex uh, uh, system in Palestine. It, 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 it's not still not handled or studied in a comprehensive way. It has different 
um, dimensions. We have conducted a study lately, we're about to finish, and it came with a one uh, result, an outcome that we have a long pack of lost um, uh, uh, issues in this system. And, and uh, locally, there is a lot of um, uh, uh, disputes between the elite uh, who disregard the farmers, which is one of the main variants that we're going to discuss. If we wanted to discuss the food system in Palestine, we're going to, to discuss the geographical aspect. We see the map here. It uh, refers to the uh, disparity, the environmental uh, disparity, which uh, uh, brings in uh, the big opportunities, which we're not making use of, like the Jordan Valley, Jerry from the Jordan, uh, Jordan Valley, and the, who, that have long uh, and big um, um, dimensions. When we talk about fine um, agricultural system or food system, it's the network uh, of uh, starting from the moment it's produced. And we note here that. Um, uh, we note that from uh, the transformation, transport to uh, manufacturing to uh, distribution to consumption and with lots of uh, factors like a political, uh, uh, social, um, spatial and environmental. So these uh, gave, uh, gave four uh, uh, dimensions for the impact on the um, on sovereignty on and food. Uh, uh, and then uh, there's the uh, social economic uh, impact. It's about uh, a job uh, um, uh, opportunities, and then the spatial uh, influ uh, um, influence, and then the environment uh, in, uh, in, uh, influence. And this we will discuss later. If we're going to uh, dismantle this food system, we, there are two t different types, main types, the conventional one, and there's the, the, the other type, which is now escalating. It's the, the modern type, and here we see, as, as we see, it's uh, more like a, a plastic house or um, uh, houses and greenhouses. And there are four um, main dimensions. Uh, dimensions. First is... So, so we're talking about uh, there are some positive um, uh, um, issues uh, like uh, the uh, um, uh, stunting of children is less than uh, anywhere else in the world, which means we don't we do not have a, a problem in this regard. But there are other uh, uh, variables, and that show uh, that only uh, forty two percent of our children get uh, uh, food in a balanced way. Uh, there's also an ex escalating problem uh, in the, and has been seen in the uh, last 10 years is obesity, uh, ob obesity and its implications. And, and we see that 38% of women uh, suffer um, some obesity at 26 uh, women, uh, men also uh, have obesity. So there's about so half a uh, quarter of men uh, uh, are uh, obese, and what we need in consumption is that there's an increase uh, to uh, uh, the trend of uh, empty uh, calories, uh, which is uh, not um, uh, fortified by vitamins and minerals, as should this type of food. And as we know, and that where all indicators show that pregnant women. Uh, um, uh, and lactating women uh, are under um, uh, malnourished, uh, and, and in Gaza we see that uh, the Bedouin families in Area C also suffer the same. Uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, variants in this uh, um, uh, dimension is uh, the shortage of uh, chronic deficiency and um, um, and low micronutrients. Um, and there's another study that is uh, that shows that there's a, a, a shortage in zinc, which is very much uh, linked to immune the immune system. And we noticed that 31% of children um, suffer from the uh, uh, shortage of um, zinc and and these micro uh, nutrients and the lack of fortified uh, fortified um, um, chem vitamins. Uh, the, uh, historically. Uh, the socio the um, uh, food system was uh, the main factor of jobs in uh, for the youth and men but this is diminishing uh, this has been diminishing in the past years there are two important uh, two uh, notes to uh, note, note uh, this is a very low illiteracy rate which is a very uh, uh, this is positive and also a young society which gives us uh, good opportunities uh, but at the same time
time it creates more um, uh, oppor- uh, 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 challenges because we need to provide um, uh, 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 job opportunities for the job. Uh, the, one of the main uh, negatives in this uh, is the, 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 the occupation. Uh, there's very limited access for resources uh, in Area C. And then another uh, uh, variant that we don't do our job as we should. So, and because we see that there's a lack of functional cooperatives, we've been uh, uh, how high poverty is also a, a very uh, has a very big impl- impact, especially in uh, like in Gaza, uh, uh, like blue in in uh, Gaza and orange in the West Bank, and and of course this is due to uh, a siege and uh, wars and invasions. In, uh, as for unemployment, the very uh, rates are very high in Gaza. Uh, it, and it's uh, it's uh, medium to low in the West Bank. In the West Bank, it's uh, um, uh, there is unemployment. However, if 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 the farmer in the West Bank needs uh, workers, he wouldn't find any because the young uh, people or the youth don't like to to work in in agricultural um, uh, jobs. At the same time, they work uh, as laborers in the Israeli markets. Uh, as for the gender issue, women uh, uh, don't uh, uh, don't uh, share the decision making. As for the territorial balance, it's uh, important to uh, there's the the um, uh, this is separation between the West Bank and Gaza. It's very difficult to have a balance uh, in because of the lack of sources. Uh, there are uh, areas with scarce. Uh, uh, scarcity, high scarcity of water uh, resources, whereas in Tulkarim and Kalkili are rich with the water resources. And we're talking about irrigation water. There are uh, uh, areas that uh, that we we have not worked in. Uh, these are uh, for irrigation um, uh, or uh, uh, water harvesting. Area C uh, uh, um, uh, is there's complete sovereignty for the occupation, and we know that uh, the settlement uh, distribution also is linked somehow to the water resources in addition to the in addition to the ideological dimensions in uh, environment uh, is that we need to manage and uh, manage the resources maintain them and sustain um, irrigation and one of the main ch- ch- challenges is the urbanization uh, like in tubas engineering we noticed that the uh, urbanization has um, expanded a lot there's another uh, important thing is the fragmentation of agricultural lands which uh, needs a solid uh, solution in order to maintain agriculture there's also ir- irrational use of uh, agrochemicals uh, this stu- in a study that was conducted three years ago uh, we found out that 70 percent uh, or more uh, we we um, uh, uh, use um, uh, pesticides more than the should. As for the water crisis in Gaza, is also uh, uh, quality because it, it's uh, polluted by uh, chlor and uh, um, uh, nutrients. Uh, as for the vulnerability to climate change, we, we believe in it. Uh, the studies uh, show that uh, there will be an increase in uh, temperature. Uh, in, in the coming decades, which uh, really worries us, because in, uh, in, the, uh, in um, the northern of, uh, um, uh, of Palestine, uh, water or uh, rain will, will be less, but it, it will end summer, and, and the summer time will increase by two months, and it will be less in two, uh, in two months. So, uh, as for uh, also uh, uh, the so and this will change the in agricultural uh, um, uh, irrigation will will increase there uh, so uh, what's more important is how can we uh, uh, transform this into a positive aspect especially in agricultural areas in the uh, jordan valley and there's also as i mentioned there are two um, uh, uh, agricultural or food systems in Palestine, the traditional one, which is uh, environment friendly, but it's not uh, does not have economic returns. Uh, the income it does not exceed more than three hundred dollars for one dunam. Uh, of course, uh, it's seasonal uh, labor, and there's all, uh, um, increasing immigration, and there's a fragmentation of ownership, and the increase in the land um, uh, prices, which is one of the main problems. Uh, the modern food system is uh, it's uh, 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 so the modern system is not uh, friendly, environment friendly, because uh, there's uh, intense use of the chemicals. But it is chemically uh, returning, and it, uh, the return is about three thousand to four thousand uh, dollars for a dunam uh, per uh, uh, per dunam. 
in a year. Uh, uh, there's uh, like uh, colored um, papers and, and so on, and it is a, a, a good income to uh, to families who own water shares and uh, there's an uh, increase in the uh, operational capacity so how we, can we um, uh, can do the calculations if these uh, if, if we can uh, use these as intense um, uh, agricultural uh, food system and not uh, as traditional ones also that are uh, in, uh, un, uh, environmental friendly we will be able to create 80,200 uh, uh, to 8 80,000 to 100,000 uh, um, uh, job opportunities and, and um, it, it, during the 10 years, the coming 10 years, and, uh, and also uh, 200,000 to uh, 250,000 uh, opportunities new. Other uh, sectors that we see promising are the um, uh, seasonal uh, fruits uh, uh, areas. We, we, we import more than 80% of what we consume and like tropical fruits. We, uh, as uh, for uh, the uh, citruses that are easy to uh, peel like lemons, uh, medical verbs like uh, for, uh, medical herbs, uh, uh, strawberries, um, in, um, local plants uh, that uh, need irrigation or com complementary and uh, livestock uh, with uh, taking care of uh, uh, this and and then uh, um, uh, however we don't have enough uh, and cows and uh, and 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 uh, as for the um, uh, fish in uh, also are promising in in water um, farms and and uh, olives and uh, grapes uh, to be um, manufactured so it could be and 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 this is something important to be used in uh, food processing as we know uh, the, these uh, are to protect land uh, luckily, um, there are many rising uh, sectors like uh, uh, lactate cows and cows and, and uh, seedless uh, grapes. Uh, there in Anasaria and areas uh, next to Tammun, uh, there's the, uh, the uh, cherry tomatoes or the cluster. Uh, of course, this is a success story. It is a success story for the farmer, and we're talking about farmers, young farmers. Uh, and this uh, is a parallel to uh, the uh, dates, um, uh, uh, agriculture and farming in, in uh, Jericho, in the Jordan Valley. So we're talking about young farmers and not big enterprises. One of the main challenges that we face uh, currently uh, is the occupation, of course. There is uh, a, a short, big shortage of um, skilled workers uh, and also the urbanization and fragmentation, marketing and functional uh, uh, cooperatives. And uh, the, now we, the, we don't have enough uh, the cooperatives uh, and as for and, uh, and applied research, of course, this needs a lot to be worked. So, uh, um, um, is some, uh, up till now, um, uh, it's uh, like uh, 20 tons uh, production, whereas in, in Israel, it's 50 to, uh, tons, and, and in Europe, it's uh, even uh, more than that. So, if we use the and apply knowledge in the right way and applied research, this will increase and multiply the production. So this is, so up till now we did not make use of all these. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we might uh, disagree with some part, but this will be in the questions and answers. Now. by Anna Qawi and Munis Alfar, a paper titled Evaluating the Evaluation of uh, Funding on the Financial... Okay, now he's going to explain that. He just used a new uh, word in Arabic. funding or fundraising, I believe, on uh, economic development in the Palestinian territories.
Good morning, everyone. On behalf of myself and my colleague, Muniz Alfar, I'm going to, present, to make the presentation. The title of our paper is Evaluating the Effect of uh, Funding. But to start with, we need to mention the structural relation between funding and new liberal uh, capitalism, new liberalism, as the, according to David Hartley, it is a theory for political economic practices that propose that human progress can be best by unleashing the individual initiatives and liberties within the framework, an institutional framework that protects the individual rights and free markets and trade. And in this context, the state's role is limited to finding the institutional framework to protect individual rights through uh, law enforcement institutions and to ensure by force, if necessary, the best performance for the markets and establish these markets if not established yet. Also, under new liberalism, the role of the state should be very minimal. And the new liberalism is distinguished with privatization and the withdrawal of the state from social uh, support and from the deregulation uh, of all the labor markets and financial system. And as a result of lifting regulations of of uh, the uh, labor market, then there is a greater uh, uh, importance, significance, economic and political for the funding sector. So funding as, according to Epstein Tani, it is the increased incentive, financial incentives in the economic policies and the hegemony of the financial markets over the economic uh, processes. And in spite of the development and growth of the financial market, especially after abolishing the Britain Mods of 1971, yet there is a great disparities in the pace of development of financing. Financing in the progressed countries or developed countries that depend on financial markets which is to call market-based financial systems, established uh, products such as financial products, and which made it extremely difficult uh, to evaluate. And thus, it's difficult. We, we saw the financial crisis in 2007-2009. But uh, it takes a different meaning in different countries. We're dealing uh, in the uh, uh, growing markets on, uh, on average or regular shares. Although these markets are not active and with minimal liquidity, that's why the financial sector is based on banking mainly. So these markets, it's bank-based financial systems. So according to our paper, the banking finance, financing is what we call uh, in our title, al amwala So nonetheless, this, uh, this financing has become a major character of capitalist neoliberalism. It is said that of the uh, 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 results of this system is that the rate in profit is higher than growth in real economy. So this means that the increased profit is at the expense of payment, which makes individuals believing in new liberalism to go to banks to meet their needs. Thus, new liberalism feeds uh, uh, financing and the other way around also increasing the credit markets is also another uh, character of this system. 
in the United States of America, they facilitated acceding access to bank loans by liberalizing or deregulating the banking system. While in Palestine, there is a higher pace for financing because of a series of pol government policies and decisions. Financing, which is the most important input uh, provided by the banking system to the economy, is capable of making uh, uh, secondary change if channeled to tackle or address a number of national challenges related to the hegemony of the Israeli market and to create a resistance market. We don't say this is a solution, but it can constitute some solutions within the uh, margin available. With every crisis with the occupation, we notice the economic factor even much clearer. Since the establishment of the Salam Fayyad government in 2007, there were, uh, the government adopted a number of unprecedented uh, new liberal policies to, bend, to build a state by uh, uh, consolidating economic progress and development. And in order to achieve this end, they promoted to expanding the role of banking in financing through a, 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 a package of policies that encourage giving uh, credit and consolidates the hegemony of banks in the market and encourage directly promoting bank loans in a way that increases liquidity in the Palestinian economy. This policy constitutes one of the available tools that enable the PMA, Palestinian Monetary Authority, to directly change the economy due to lack of control over other uh, financial uh, resources because of the uh, Paris Accords. The Palestinian Authority is not a full sovereign uh, government that can change, uh, make economic change by making change in the uh, cash or financial uh, uh, policies, but it can make effect on the financial ones, and especially in the national budget, a budget that is suffering a deficit and relies on uh, donations and grants, and also does not have control over a major part of the government revenues, which limits its potential and consolidates the hegemony of the Israeli occupation. As for the cash and monetary policies in fully sovereign countries, this is not available to the Palestinian Authority since we don't have a national currency or a central bank. Thus, the Palestinian Monetary Authority indirectly and partially affects the available cash in the economy by issuing instructions that affect the policy of lending at the banks. And this was clearly reflected through the intensive campaigns by the banks to encourage uh, lending by creating an active consumer uh, environment by relying on loans. So competition increased between banks and a lot of campaigns competing to encourage loans for marriage, for housing and cars, and mortgage, especially for the public sector employees. And land registration project has had a role in encouraging uh, uh, loans because this allows them to use that as securities for to gain loans. And this policy continued in different forms. Banks had campaigns to issue new credit cards or to increase the limit of these credit, existing credit cards. And these campaigns extended to cover university tuition fees. And there was a great encouragement to invest in the stock market. Even in the schools, children are taken uh, to the uh, stock market. In 2014, there is a strategy, Palestinian strategy for financial uh, inclusion was developed in order to allow all the components of the society, including the marginalized and those with limited income, to use the financial uh, tools. In this paper, 
the search seeks to uh, uh, discuss one of the objectives that is that is to discuss if these uh, credit or facilitations do they uh, uh, positively in, uh, affect the Palestinian economic situation in Palestine the research evaluates one of the most important interventions by the uh, monetary authority number five of 2008 issued under the title of uh, capital markets and banking indicators this article 7 states that all banks in palestine should not uh, invest more than 55 percent of the deposits by August 2009. And this policy in the instructions and directives as by Jihad al-Wazir, the governor of the monetary authority, to encourage internal investments. And in order to ensure uh, implementation of this, banks either have to uh, liquidate their investments abroad or to increase their deposits. In both cases, there will be a surplus in liquidity where the banks will have to invest this directly in the Palestinian economy or through credit justification facilitations, and this could be productive or consumptive. The production loans are the ones that are used to fund new projects or to develop existing projects by buying uh, raw materials or machines or whatever. The, in, the consumption goal uh, uh, loans are to buy commodities such as refrigerators or cars or maybe for treatment or for travel. As for previous uh, studies uh, across the world countries with our reservation, some studies, some they say the relation between funding and development banking is a neutral relation. Some they say it could be causal one, but it is not clear if it is from the banking funding to the economy or the other way around. Some they say it is both way. And so the policy of the military authority increased the credit in the uh, local markets. The banks uh, pumped more of their uh, uh, funds in the local economy and there was an increased uh, progress after 2008 the amount of loans granted to the private sector by all banks in palestine increased by 6.6 .6 billion dollars between 2008 and 2010 and the credit uh, uh, increased from 1.7 to billion dollars to 10 billion dollar in 2020 with an increase of 571% <clears throat> and an annual 16% uh, growth rate. Now, will this increase in the credit level? Had, did it have an impact on the economic growth in Palestine? The reality shows that lending in the Palestinian banks does not contribute to supporting productive sectors. The Palestinian banks channeled a majority of their credit portfolio to fund consumption loans at the expense of credit for the production sector, such as in agriculture, tourism, and others. The uh, graph that uh, is on the screen indicates the dis distribution of uh, loans to the uh, private sector from 20, 2008 to 2020. And we notice that there is a great uh, surge in funding uh, consumption loans. In 2008, these loans were here. After 12 years, they, we jumped here. Same thing in real estate and construction. 
the increase in consumption loans was 1,921%. In cars and vehicles, it was 920% increase. In construction and real estate, 857% increase. As for the share of each sector in lending, 23% of loans 2020 were directed to uh, construction, followed by trade 19%, then consumption loans 18%. And if we add to that the cars ones, then the consumption loans make around 23%, where the less privileged ones are industry, uh, 6%, agriculture and agribusiness, 2%, and tourism, 1%. Maybe Dr. Jamil can have something to add. Uh, some studies uh, say that the problem is not only in giving loans uh, to the agricultural sector, but we have an issue of demand here. The market in the agriculture sector, they have an issue of uh, demand. The funding uh, indicator, which is the percentage of local credit provided to the private sector, the percentage out of the GDP, there was an increase. It became 52% of the GDP between the year 1998 to 2020. And the increase was in 2020, which is a very high percentage compared to the Middle East. To the Middle East countries, which was much more. As indicated by the World Bank, also funding in Palestine is higher than the fragile countries that are affected by the conflict, which Palestine is part of and became 14.3% only in the year 2019. Although funding in Palestine is higher than others in other countries, yet it is far away from the levels of a credit that caused a crisis in developed countries. And maybe these statistics justify at least partially the financial crisis that many households and SMEs are suffering because of the high debt and uh, banking crisis, which was clear during the lockdown because of the COVID-19 in 2020. And although the comparison with other countries is important to uh, evaluate the debt level, yet each economy has its own speciality and character. So there is no one model that is fit, that fits all. Nonetheless, the high level of lending in last decade, 16% annually growing, is very uh, worrying because of the fragility of the economy and difficulty of ensuring its sustainability because of the occupation. The uh, banking, uh, bank funding, it, too, it did not go in line with uh, government uh, economic policies that support the local economy or to mitigate the, the Israeli economic hegemony. In our research, we took a, a sample of data from the year, annual uh, data from the year 2001 to 2020, and we used the difference in difference model to find the causal relationship between funding and change. The summary of the results indicate that the uh, policy of the Palestinian Monetary Authority has had a positive role only in the percentage of credit facilitations or support granted to the private sector compared to the GDP. And this impact statistically is significant, whereas other indicators such as uh, for development uh, an, uh, unemployment or poverty or GDP, there is no statistically significant effect because to the increased bank loans. So we move in this research to the policy 
because policies, the development uh, uh, policies continue. Like we continue considering that uh, pumping uh, cash into or liquidity into the market is something good, is something good. But the regulations force the banks to make available the cash by reducing external funding uh, investment and allow banks to manage that liquidity instead of regulating or channeling that to other productive ones in order to encourage the local economy. In spite of the authorities of the the uh, or the powers of the PMA to do so, Article, for instance, 40 of the law that allows the PMA, Policy Monetary Authority, to limit the credit levels and its conditions, and also the minimum and uh, maximum levels of uh, fees that banks take for funding. And as long as banks are for the profit, then they seek to achieve, to maximize their profit within the minimal risk. So the, the, the economic development considerations not necessarily ranking high on their priority list. So the funding, it was not for a productive objectives. The amount of banks for industry and agriculture and others was not more than 50%, and the government relied completely on the market instead of actively playing a role in providing capitalist loans, a matter that uh, can uh, potentially uh, strengthen quality and competitiveness with the uh, imported products, especially Israeli products. It would be wise to plan to mitigate the Israeli economic hegemony by channeling banking uh, loans or credits to encourage having quality local products in line with tax policies and support for local producers to encourage local production. Number two, the, uh, uh, the surplus of uh, consumption loans did not go in line with government policies that encourage them to buy their national products to be beast needs and not simply to meet their uh, greed for uh, imported goods. Also, the absence, oh sorry, these loans were used the, uh, I mean, for products that the state was not supporting them. So the new liberal policies made citizens to go to the market a matter that strengthens the hegemony of the state at the expense of the market at the expense of the state. Having private schools and other factors is a product of absence of the government policies to support public education. And also people also are buying vehicles because government is not providing public transportation. In addition to the uh, absence of the role of the state and channeling credits in line with policies of occupation has structurally increased the or strengthened the Israeli economic hegemony over the Palestinian economy on the other side. This dependence on the market that is facilitated by the loans and absence of enough uh, uh, government support uh, strengthens the hegemony of the market. This hegemony increases the uh, uh, weakness of the Palestinian market in facing the Israeli economy. And the reason is that the Palestinian market is unable to stand the pressures by the, most, the more advanced Israeli economy. So the increased funding through loans not only strengthens the hegemony of the market in Palestine, but also it increases the hegemony of the Israeli market over the Palestinian market. So strengthening the market at the expense of the state means less ability to compete or to push back against the hegemony of the Israeli market. And also it has impact on the overall economy. At the individual level, uh, the individuals going for loans strengthens the uh, style of that life, that consumption life for luxury and not for real needs. And 
increases gives support for the individual interest instead of that collective interest national interest as for the economy these consumption loans encourage the economy um, on the short run as they increase the liquidity for individuals and households to buy consumption commodities a matter that limits demand in the market if demand increased on local products this would have positive impact for by producing job opportunities and more local production but if demand is for imported services and goods so this will not necessarily have good impact on the economy in addition that it is a government revenue source where the government collects uh, taxes for the authority and with the uh, e-marketing or e-shopping uh, a number of shopping and booking are done through external markets third and finally the absence of the state in channeling credit in line with the policies of the occupation has led to the uh, 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 or the uh, uh, structuring or structurally affecting in a negative way the Palestinian economy compared to the economic to the contributions of the different economic sectors at the expense of uh, productive sectors such as industry and agriculture some that consider as an output or result of dependency on the Israeli economy as per Shitaki, the internal trade got the highest percentage in the GDP which is 22 percent services 20 and agriculture only seven percent and transformation industry is 13 almost in line with this there was an increase in the banking loans provided to the internal trade Tenor trade is the second tenor sector after uh, the aforementioned uh, consumption sector. This credit provided to internal business from 300 million in 2008 has increased to 1.3 billion dollar in 2020, with an increase of 310 percent in 10 years almost, because of the absence of the government policies and because of the Israeli military and economic policies that uh, uh, increase the role of the Israeli business, there is a class in the Palestinian society, which is the business people, which is the top uh, uh, class connected with the Israeli economy. And that class has consolidated connectivity, connecting the Palestinian uh, market with the Israeli market by uh, bringing commodities from Israel, importing it. And so there is a large number of capitalist business people in Palestine who are politically detached and having uh, uh, interests that are in line with the Israeli business people. So that class tends to peace and negotiation with the occupier, with the occupier to protect its interests. We know what BMC uh, cards do for business people. Not only the crossing, they can travel and import. So it is... Uh, uh, a group that is uh, detached. To summarize, history tells us that development strategy cannot achieve without a major role played by the state. And so <laughs> increased dependency on the state and decline in the role of the state can prevent having a, a development significant strategy. Through a development strategy, the state role can include all or some of the following protecting local pro, uh, production, support for some products, low-cost loans, especially in the uh, production uh, sectors, and supporting research and development, a good health system, good education system, and good uh, uh, public transportation system. And, and not to allow the resources according to the base on the needs of the market. Yeah. Uh, we really enjoyed your speech, and now we, we go to the um, to Abdelhamid Tamimi with his paper, uh, 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 Israeli Policies on Controlling uh, Water Resources.
good morning for uh, it's uh, it's true I'm, I, I will discuss water but I'm going to avoid technical issues uh, I mean uh, engineering uh, water engineering uh, just uh, to commit to the uh, title of uh, this uh, conference it's uh, the um, political economy and uh, Germany uh, and, and so I, I tried to commit to this title and to apply it to the model I will discuss today which is water sector before starting uh, um, and before starting I started with a, um, a thesis or a saying that Israel is a state changes even before it became a state so the Zionist movement with its productivity never changes and and however it has the capacity and the uh, future vision to adapt to the international changes just to serve its settlement or colonizing um, project. Israel adapts completely to the international variables, especially in the region, just to serve its Zionist project without changing itself and beyond changing its core. And, 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 uh, opposite to what's happening in Palestine, we, we change our core, but we don't know how to adapt. In in this uh, regard, Israel is maintaining or sustaining two main elements in uh, regarding water. And and I'm talking about me, uh, water because I only understand about water. So the first is a hegemony, and the second is is uh, the subjugation, subjugation of Palestinians, not only to uh, uh, control them, but to make them uh, unable to take any step in water sector without, without uh, imposing our political vision. And in, in order to understand the thesis, thesis and in order to order to support this thesis, I would like to uh, uh, discuss the last 30 years, what ha happened in the th last 30 years, how did Israel benefit and adapt with the international um, uh, 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 variations in order to serve its uh, uh, water uh, benefits. So uh, it, is, it is something, it is liquid within the um, depth of the ground. So how did, uh, first of all, how did uh, Israel uh, benefit from uh, uh, the Israel Washington Consensus in 1989 before the uh, demolition of the, of the um, Soviet Union? There were three elements that are related to uh, the privatization, the, uh, um, uh, the freedom of uh, transferring money, um, and, and then the retreat of the role of the uh, individual. This is what Israel did since the establishment of the Zionist movement and until the beginning of the 90s, Israel had, ha uh, the water had, uh, was a pu public sector that was 100% uh, owned by the state in its management uh, uh, institutions it, and financed by, this, uh, um, by um, the state. But then it started to change its policies and it uh, allowed to uh, establish sanitation um, uh, uh, stations and then it, it uh, created the uh, Ministry of uh, Water that was headed by Ariel Sharon and then it was transferred to the Water Authority that was functioning after beyond the government's control. The second element is that Israel has started to uh, promote around the world, just as was said um, in the Washington Consensus, that water is a commodity and not a right. And so uh, it's commodification of water. It's uh, considering it as a commodity, and this, and this is what we see how it served its uh, colonizing vision. Israel also has benefited from the uh, at, um, approaches of the World Bank in order to restructure uh, of uh, water around the world and in in our region, uh, in what is called the MENA region. Uh, uh, almost, almost all uh, uh, countries have restructured their water uh, sector as per the uh, request from the World Bank, and we will see now why they did this. As for the uh, Barcelona Declaration, have uh, um, referred clearly 
I think in 19, it was 1995, have clearly pointed out to the privatization and, uh, and clearly point out to the necessity to have regional cooperation. And this is where uh, Israel has started to infiltrate itself uh, through the, uh, such a cooperation just to uh, control um, uh, water. Same for the uh, greater uh, Middle East and the new uh, Middle East, whether it was uh, of uh, Shimon Peres or uh, Condoleezza Rice. And, and not only uh, this infiltration through what's called a regional cooperation or uh, to um, uh, uh, confront or encounter the climate change or to uh, mitigate um, the needs uh, for uh, uh, traditional water or try to find uh, new res water resources like uh, salitation. Uh, Israel is the second country in the world in water salination. So this is how they've been benefited from the, such international organizations and international uh, entities and projects in the region to uh, uh, um, spread its hegemony and to infiltrate to the Middle East. Uh, and we will see later uh, how, how did this affect um, its stability. We will now look into three models um, that we as Palestinians uh, uh, had. I'm not going to discuss the technical um, issues. Israel is co uh, controlling 80% of our res water resources. Uh, the Oslo Accord, I have, I have a, a definition. Uh, so, uh, so there's a, a, zig, a, zero, a big zero at the beginning and a big zero at the end, and we're still running between the two zeros. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about water here. So uh, and, and other and other uh, issues, maybe the two zeros are, are much bigger. Anyway, in uh, in Oslo uh, Accord, there were three issues that Israel have empowered itself through the hegemony I, I just mentioned earlier. It's not only about the uh, to benefit from the international stat, uh, position or hegemony to uh, benefit from the regional uh, projects uh, and uh, the greater B Middle East and the new uh, Middle East and uh, Barcelona and and uh, the alliance of the uh, uh, Mediterranean. All this, all these uh, Israel have benefited from in, in uh, um, um, hegemony, but the infiltration, infiltration, how did it happen? In, in Oslo, at the beginning of it started with Oslo. In Oslo, there are four main issues that were very important uh, for uh, Israel. And I personally, uh, we say that the Palestinians, that Israel did not commit to the uh, um, to the implementation of agreements. Well, in uh, regarding water, it did uh, uh, implement it hundred percent because the hundred percent were in its favor. Uh, Oslo had um, and uh, point 14, 1914, it, um, it discussed, said that uh, recognition of the Palestinian right in water, that was the first. And then in the fourth uh, item, it mentioned that the final um, uh, uh, negotiations will define what are the rights. So when, when they came to the uh, bilateral um, negotiation, they said, no, no, we're talking about the right of benefit and not the right to uh, have the, and not the right of ownership. It's uh, the, how to use, just the use, the right of use and not the right of ownership. And then they separated between the resources and the services, so whether you can spend as much, you uh, uh, consume water as much as you can, but I'm the owner. I can give you uh, as much as I want, but you use it as you wish. So it's, it's um, uh, you want to sell it in, in Nablus or uh, Hebron or uh, Nablus, but the source, I'm on the controller of the main uh, uh, source. And that's why um, 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 to have a control on resources was never mentioned. The Jordan Valley was never mentioned. But what's most um, risky in the Oslo uh, relationship is that the relationship between the Palestinian Authority and here I'm, uh, between the Palestinian Authority and the State of Israel, between the and Makarot actually, and Makarot is is a commercial relationship. And after the uh, signature of the agreement, Israel raised uh, the, uh, the the price of its uh, um, uh, of the cost. And and the relationship is where Makarot um, uh, um, company and not the government of Israel. What happened next is that there were projects on a local level uh, under the. Um, 
guidance of the World Bank, other projects on the regional uh, level also under the um, control of the World Bank or the management of the World Bank and uh, funders, just to let Israel in to benefit, uh, as I said, to benefit from the Barcelona uh, uh, Accord or the uh, uh, other um, uh, alliances and, and, uh, and the Saudi nation, and which Israel has had it since then. In this context, there were three projects that were discussed. The um, uh, Bahrain uh, Channel, uh, the um, uh, Joint uh, Interest uh, Water, and salination projects. Let's talk about the salination projects. Israel has 12 uh, salination facilities for were established uh, with a capacity of 250 million cubic meters uh, that they're uh, active in as Ascalon and Khdera and uh, other areas. Four that are ongoing under construction and four are planned. The um, uh, head, the director of the uh, Water um, uh, Authority, Shmuel uh, Tal, said in, in Rome, uh, in, in the forum in Rome, he said uh, that was in 2017. He said in, in 2022, we will have excess of water, of salinated water, by 200 million cubic meters, and, and the consumer will, uh, and will be Jordan and the Palestinian Authority. So, and, and Jordan is now um, negotiating on to buy water from Israel, and so uh, uh, are we. So, practically, Israel exactly knows what it wants. It, it, it's looking at establishing salination facilities in return. Okay, you can take as much water as you wish, you as a Palestinian, but this has nothing to do with rights. This is uh, uh, on commercial basis. This relationship is commercial basis, and that's why Israel has privatized the water. All salination uh, facilities are private sector, and so you buy the water just like you uh, buy uh, tomatoes and like you uh, buy. Uh, there is, and this is part of the subjugation um, we buy now from Israel, uh, 83%, 83 million cubic meters yearly, and we uh, negotiate to get more. Now we uh, what, uh, what, um, what, uh, buy mixed water from the Jordan Valley and salinated water, but um, every year, every day, and if you look at the statistics, every year these numbers increase. Because our population increase and, and our capacity to extract water is uh, not um, allowed, because uh, and and so the more we, uh, we, we our needs uh, increase, the more we uh, increase our dependence on Israel. In 2030, and when we say it like this, it will be around all our water resources, all our water services will be completely dependable. About 80 to 85 percent on Israel. So this is something, this is about salination. Uh, the other point is the uh, chan, uh, Bahrain Channel. The, chan, uh, the uh, Bahrain chan, uh, Channel uh, was founded since the Johannesburg uh, Conference, uh, the summit that, uh, that Paris had uh, presented this project. It's uh, uh, the ch uh, Bahrain Channel is to transfer water from uh, the Red Sea to, to, uh, to the Dead Sea. Uh, and to uh, ben benefit from the difference in, in uh, the uh, uh, height in order to have uh, uh, water generation and um, uh, to uh, feed into uh, Amman. And also technically, um, so we're, we're going to salinate water uh, on mi uh, minus 240 below sea level and then raise it to uh, Halhul. Uh, to one, uh, one, uh, 70, uh, 1,700. Uh, so Palestinians, if they drink whiskey, it would be much cheaper for them than to get water. Because, because it will, it will cost around uh, three uh, uh, shekels per liter. But this, and that's, uh, and, and Jordan has uh, just acknowledged this and just uh, wanted to get out of this project. But but even if if uh, they uh, at least uh, this will serve Israel and it will have the salty. And if you don't want this, we'll give you that. Uh, again, uh, the, this project of Bahrain Channel is also um, it, it, it is it, it is established on a um, earthquake uh, area uh, land that is not really uh, stable, so it might happen. In. Uh, so what happens at the Bahrain Channel, it's uh, Israel uh, somehow retreated in order to oblige uh, uh, Palestinians to go on, uh, with it. 
uh, the other point, how can we restructure the um, uh, water institutions in the region and in Palestine in order to serve the uh, Israeli uh, salination projects? The World Bank uh, uh, claimed that the Palestinian, and this is there in... Um, uh, that should uh, that uh, there should have uh, four uh, uh, services into water services in Palestine: uh, north, uh, uh, central, uh, south, and Gaza. Or for will you see them uh, uh, geographically? They are parallel to the four salination facilities in um, uh, in in Palestine. in Israel. Uh, so uh, Gosh Dan to Ashkelon and so on. So it's not only that it, these serve the uh, the Zionist uh, project, but it also the cantons and 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 and, and, and now uh, uh, there is the the is the uh, cantons the cantons of the north and the center of the south and so. So this desalination is uh, uh, will will serve them in in. In buying from um, desalination uh, companies in Israel, and here we need to note uh, two things. Um, uh, we need to note uh, the uh, the complementarity between the uh, water uh, policies, uh, Israeli policies, and 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 other issues like uh, Jerusalem Judaization and settlements and uh, refugees. And then uh, to the the uh, vision to the future. What do they want in the future? Israel in the future needs uh, they wants to have Palestine from the river to the sea and to transform uh, the Palestinian citizens from citizens to customers for the desalination facilities of Israel. So this is very clear. What about accumulation? In 2030, uh, uh, 1930, there was a kibbutz in Bissan uh, before the establishment of the State of Israel. And so someone came from uh, Tennessee in the, uh, his, his name was Eli Iban. He was a water engineer. Uh, so he came to uh, help out uh, this kibbutz. Do you know what he told them? He told them three things. He said, First, uh, a good Zionist is, is uh, really uh, measured by the number of dunams he owns. So as much as a land you have, the, the better you are. Second, all the, future, the future in the valleys of um, and, 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 uh, and I'm a geology uh, engineer. So uh, like the green line uh, area. So this is where uh, mountains uh, stop and and the coast the internal coast starts. So this is where he told them uh, the, uh, the underground will go to these areas, and that's why Israel uh, have uh, deployed 120 uh, wells. Also, of they are there in the in the in side line, but they uh, reserve the water from the. Uh, West Bank Mountains. And the third thing that he um, uh, recommended them to do, told them, please uh, keep always uh, think uh, th 30 years ahead about your needs of water. And this is what's happening. Israel has set uh, the plan uh, or the seven uh, year plan, which whereby 70% uh, of the Jordan Valley water was transferred into Israel. From the uh, south, uh, in, uh, so, uh, in southern of uh, um, uh, Tiberia uh, onto Negev without passing through um, uh, West Bank lands, and uh, this is just to uh, um, uh, meet the, uh, the Zionist dream. So they, they did not change; they kept on their uh, so and and so they're abiding by their vision. And but because now um, we're running out of time, I just want to say that whatever is happening from the uh, in, in in institutionalization in, in Israel and of the um, uh, limitation of water in in projects in Palestine and desalination uh, projects under the item of needs that we need, we we have transformed the rights to needs. And and here I want to summarize and and uh, say four uh, important points. If the Palestinian people were able to control their water resources, whether the underground or our right in the Jordan Valley, then we are not in need to. Uh, uh, we are not uh, and about uh, getting the uh, 
and and we will have uh, water, and we will not need a drop of water from outside Palestine if we were able to maintain this. The second point. Uh, regarding desalination, even if it was feasible, like uh, politically at least, uh, under the in, uh, regional uh, cooperation, even if this thesis was feasible, it's not economically feasible because we in in the in the Gulf areas or in Malta or Israel, uh, the uh, um, average income of an individual is thirty five thousand dollars, and therefore he can. Um, uh, afford to pay for the cost of water, whereas the citizen in the uh, rural areas of Jenin or Jordan Valley cannot pay 2.6% uh, uh, for water or desalination, and this cost is uh, rising or decreasing uh, according to the uh, fuel or oil prices. So Israel is under the pressure of the uh, energy uh, prices around the uh, around the world, and the third point is that uh, promotion uh, that water is something that is cross uh, borders and across uh, continents and national policies. Well, yes, this is uh, true uh, as per the uh, Afurat River or or the Nile River. There uh, there are countries that. Um, uh, Share or fight for these words. Uh, 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 in, in Iraq, they don't talk about uh, their need for water, about the right of ownership. Uh, same for uh, Al Nahda Dam. They, they, they need to maintain their rights in Egypt and Sudan. And Ethiopians uh, tell them, uh, take as much water as you need, but we have a right. And they say, no, we have a historical right. And that's and, uh, as, But as for Palestinians, I think they need to. To avoid the scenario of what, buying water from Israel, and if we buy water from Israel, means more dependency and more um, more control for is from Israel to the tap, with the, the water that runs in our taps in our homes, and that uh, there will be no independent um, uh, uh, agricultural sector. And uh, thank you very much. I think Abdurrahman, that was a very good uh, um, uh, insight. Thank you so much, Mr. Abdurrahman, for this. Uh, and, and we wouldn't have uh, known the details without uh, getting into them. Now, now we, we will, will be move on. Moving to the questions. We will have two types of questions. First, the one that is uh, related to the uh, audience, and questions, other questions through. Um, the panelists or the people on the virtual, the virtual um, attendees. Allow me first being present here as the, the moderator of this session to raise some questions to each one of the speakers. There's a comment or a question for each one of you. Uh, for Jamil, you talked, you repeated the, uh, the feasibility, the economic feasibility about uh, the feasibility, who is the beneficiary? The economic uh, uh, feasibility is not something that uh, fits the needs or fits or goes in line with everyone. So who is this uh, economic feasibility directed to when you speak about the pattern, the, the modern agricultural pattern, given that there could be some benefit uh, or social benefit which goes in line with what Diane talked about, the, the, this uh, uh, Palestinian uh, segment. However, it is not uh, circulated or not. So it, it doesn't apply to all the Palestinian uh, levels. Uh, I have another question about the absence 
of the regional dimension, the regional and international dimensions linked to the lending uh, processes in the Palestinian territories. So the economic relationships between the domestic and international uh, banks, I've seen in your paper some summary or maybe an abbreviation of the financing at the monetary authority. For example, you have independent uh, uh, domestic banks that are independent from the world. So I just need you to clarify this. Dr. Abdul Rahman, I have a question for you. Something interesting uh, that you mentioned, but you did not clarify though. The Israeli water companies are private ones. They have profitable uh, interests uh, led by their own uh, projects uh, that are related, uh, connected to the liberal economy. For example, the Washington Consensus, the Bar uh, Barcelona Declaration, our understanding of the role of the companies being uh, uh, driven by their own interests gives us the impression that the state is the one who controls the practices of the company. I want to understand this, these liberal changes in the uh, set, settlement, uh, the, the state of settlements. To what extent can we say that this uh, state still controls the mechanism, the work mechanisms of the, uh, of the companies, uh, given that these uh, companies are part of the world uh, uh, market uh, that are profitable and work for their own interests. We need you also to uh, clarify this or explain it for us as uh, as audience. I would open the floor now for uh, the uh, audience's questions, and then we move to the Q&A. Please uh, introduce yourself first and uh, say who you are di directing the question to. Bara Arifai, good morning. I have two questions. One for Mr. Jamir Harb. You spoke, uh, your uh, presentation is invaluable. It's, uh, it's very realistic. However, something attracted my attention. I felt that there was some kind of contradiction the uh, modern uh, trend of uh, using uh, the technology in farming or an, an agriculture goes in parallel with the rise of labor hands. So the technology and the using of uh, greenhouses and the more modern uh, systems uh, that, uh, uh, like you said, 150 uh, laborers uh, uh, would lose their jobs if we use the modern uh, systems, uh, modern technological systems in the agricultural uh, sector. Also, another comment for Ms. Bayan Arqawi, uh, in general, your uh, paper could be more descriptive than giving us recommendations or or be closer to what's next, the next step. I work with the Palestinian Islamic Bank. We have uh, data and information about uh, the financial and the banking uh, sector. In general, I can say that uh, the efforts of uh, economic developments uh, by the Palestinian uh, banks uh, are present in supporting the uh, economy, but it is rather individual, uh, rather than a regulatory uh, a system by the monetary authority. In addition, we would not uh, uh, miss mentioning the uh, capital uh, sector, uh, the, uh, the capital market uh, 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 sector. We have the Palestinian uh, commerce uh, who uh, provide uh, equipment for uh, agricultural production and then they, they take the returns, uh, the future returns. So these are efforts, uh, these are individual efforts but can be regulated uh, in cooperation between the, uh, uh, the Palestinian monetary, the Palestinian government government uh, and uh, the uh, Palestinian Capital uh, uh, Commission. So we need first to address uh, the risks, the general risks, and then we can tell where what uh, what are the uh, pre, uh, what are the uh, uh, economic uh, sectors that should take the priority after the COVID-19? Uh, it is not merely to uh, to uh, to support uh, the uh, economic development, but first to recover from the uh, economic stagnation. Uh, uh, the Palestinian Monetary Authority has uh, recently launched uh, the, the Sustainability Fund, uh, 434 million dollars to support uh, the all the sectors, and this is in the context of. Uh, uh, 
protection or uh, economic development. I hope we can go uh, come up with a recommendation for the uh, for the Palestinian government, uh, the monetary authority, to start to unify their efforts to first address the risks and then go into a consensus as a, a public money uh, sector, uh, banks, uh, uh, trade, uh, so that we can uh, uh, reduce uh, the unemployment and poverty as much as possible. Uh, given the context that you are living in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take a, a group of questions and then you would be answering them. We have another two questions on the virtual chat. Uh, hello, everyone. My uh, question is to Dr. Arqawi. I assume to make actual development uh, in light of the Palestinian context uh, or situation, it should be a development process, a directed development process, and should be monitored by the state. That's the minimum. My question, are the Palestinian policies taken into consideration this? I'm talking about uh, the financialization, as you said. Who, uh, who sets uh, the financialization uh, uh, policies and is there a mechanism to push this forward and how the decision maker, the economic decision maker take into account the uh, development, the rising development uh, process under the occupation. I'm talking about development under the occupation. I'm asking about the methodology, the mechanisms and the uh, practical uh, applications or uh, and this is uh, this overlaps with what Dr. Tamimi uh, said. Uh, is what happening a uh, fate or destiny and uh, it's a dead end or is there a possibility or a potential for change? I can move to part of the questions. Let's take the questions on the, the Q&A and then we uh, take more questions from the audience. We have two questions. One uh, says, do you see the rising of uh, China is a form of a challenge of the, for the uh, neoliberal uh, system. And how can we use uh, uh, the, what's going on to our own struggle, uh, uh, interest, given that uh, China is not a neoliberal? How do you see the emergence of China challenging the hegemony of neoliberalism and how could we use the new theater of competition to, to, to benefit our struggle. The other question is by uh, Tariq Sadiq is for Jamil Harb. You said that uh, the water resources are uh, the settlements, uh, the geographical locations of the settlements uh, the settlements are connected to uh, water resources locations uh, uh, are uh, are there uh, any maps uh, that uh, clarify these uh, water resources and the settlements? Another question for Bayan uh, regarding the pre-Oslo uh, stage or uh, uh, the the occupation uh, uh, prohibited the, the, finance, the financialization and the work of the banking sector. Uh, how do you explain this? How do you interpret this? Is it connected to the uh, Palestinian banks, uh, uh, th that the Palestinian banks are under Israeli control. What is the uh, cause of this uh, shift that made the Palestinian banks under Israeli control? If we go back to the audience here in the room, thank you. I'm Taysir Zabri, uh, head of the board of directors of FATEN. I have more than one question uh, for uh, Bayan. Uh, the paper did not address uh, the small businesses uh, funding uh, that are non-profitable. Uh, she focused on the issue of banks and the profitable profitability and the instructions of the monetary authority, the neoliberalism, and the role of Salam Fayyad. However, there's a main item that 
that currently takes or occupies an important part, at least 500 million dollars uh, that are spent uh, annually by the insurance companies, uh, or sorry, by the uh, micro-financing fin businesses. Uh, only a week ago, there was a workshop uh, people talked about uh, other institutions uh, from the housing uh, fund for example like the retire uh, the retired uh, commission there are co co uh, cooperatives who who, uh, uh, who offer uh, uh, loans so are these loans are for development or for consumption uh, uh, despite that i don't want to take much of your time but we for example 95 percent of the loans are productive loans second there is uh, some sort of uh, uh, of uh, um, misdefinition of the uh, consumption uh, loans. Uh, for example, housing is a, a necessary uh, is a need. Uh, a, a poor person in a village wants to buy, for example, a refrigerator. This is something uh, considered uh, uh, consumption. Uh, so we need to increase uh, the uh, agricultural and industrial uh, uh, production, etc. If a person who is incapable of uh, fixing uh, his or her own home for $10,000 uh, before the uh, the rain starts, uh, this is a problem because this is supposed to, to be called a consumption loan. So I believe it's important to, uh, to check uh, the types and sources and resources of loans. Uh, and like uh, my colleague from the Palestine Bank mentioned, uh, uh, now we have uh, loans uh, by the European countries through them, uh, about uh, 500 millions they were given through the Monetary Authority to commercial banks to, uh, to offer uh, development uh, uh, loans. So the paper does not cover the uh, development loans, nor does it uh, cover the nonprofit uh, uh, companies. Uh, I mean, the micro-financing uh, uh, companies, uh, I hope that, uh, I, th I think this is a gap. I think your paper needs to be uh, complemented in order to go deeper into these issues. I, there's something I want to share with you, though, uh, that policy uh, followed uh, 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 during uh, the Salam era, they did not uh, take from the banks. The banks uh, uh, depend or rely on the basic law, uh, uh, de uh, relying or uh, uh, approving uh, the free economy. But during Salam and after Salam, they work in the same manner. Uh, Salam expend, uh, spent uh, a big part of the international uh, donations or funds on uh, Area C. I think this needs to be uh, corrected uh, uh, politically and economically. Uh, uh, I th we are not only talking the politics and economics uh, or the interests or benefits of certain people. It is important to, to verify the facts and to mention statistics or figures i have information that there are that hundreds of millions were spent uh, on area c and i know those uh, or know uh, some of uh, these uh, areas and those uh, were the state uh, uh, money thank you for uh, Uh, and a land expert in uh, Birzeit University, I want to emphasize what Dr. Abdurrahman Tamimi said. Israel does not change, but adapts. The, what proves this is that it is privatizing the uh, water dissemination, whereas uh, stealing the, the water from the Palestinians, even though the resource is the land, the water resource is the land, and the land the, the, the law that controls us, is that, which is the land, the water and land law, uh, is owned by Israel. As uh, since Israel is uh, is priv is privatizing the benefit, it's controlling the lands. Israel is leasing, actually. It's not selling the land. It's uh, or making it private. It's it's le leasing the land. They are adapting to their own benefit and interest and for the purpose of hegemony, just to, to emphasize our reliance of us as Palestinians to the Israelis, to the Israeli side, and they have already put themselves on the safe side because they are the ones who are controlling the land and the water rights are, the, are connected to the land rights. I'm talking about the settlement of land and water, not lands alone. So since... They are not allowing position or ownership of land. 
to be private. The land, all the land that they have are state property, and since uh, uh, the area C are uh, under the occupation, and uh, they have made them their own land for the future, they are only leasing or uh, uh, the dissemination of water just to benefit from the monies of the uh, of the uh, beneficiaries, and also to make us uh, rely on them uh, perpetually. Thank you. I was criticized for using Q&A. Q&A. You mean questions and answers. Let's go back to the uh, panelists. You have heard the questions. Can you answer them individually or maybe if you want to share the uh, answers? regarding the water uh, companies in Israel. I didn't have enough time to clarify many things. First, in terms of management, they are managed by the private sector, but in terms of policies, they are uh, managed by the Israeli uh, government. The uh, contract, the commercial contract uh, with the, they should be approved by the state. The amounts or the volume of water to be exported uh, should also be uh, approved by the state. Uh, administratively, they're called uh, uh, private, but these uh, companies go in partnership with other uh, international companies, so they save the money, uh, the cost money. Israel provides or introduces itself as a model of solving the water problems in the world. A company is merely a tool of this uh, model. The other thing I wanted to address, but didn't have enough time now, or they are fooling the regional Arab and Palestinian minds, saying that we have to bring in technocrats into the water uh, into the uh, water system. A technocrat is a person like me, a person who who, is, who, care, who cares about uh, the technical results rather than who doesn't have a, 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 a political vision. Who should be a per, uh, the the party who should be uh, managing the water sector in Palestine is a political. Whereas uh, the technocrat who doesn't uh, was not good in the political decision makings is this could be um, a, a very uh, a serious and a dangerous thing, and thus uh, the state and the European uh, 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 investment bank are happy. They say, yeah, let's have a technocrat. Uh, they think it's a, an easy task, but they are not uh, well aware of the political uh, situation or the political aspect or reality uh, of Israel. <laughs> Another question on Zoom about the parallel economy or what Abdullah Najjar calls escaping from the official, uh, official uh, economy like tax evasion, buying uh, commodities from the Israeli market, uh, importing uh, through an Israeli exporter or importer. So how, to, how does this contribute to the hegemony, the Israeli hegemony over the Palestinian economy? This might need, might need you to answer, Dr. Jamil, please. I want to answer some uh, of the questions. What Dr. Ala al the uh, economic feasibility, the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, society is um, a capitalistic one. There are water rights in some areas that are connected to the land directly. Who is the economic beneficiary? It's not as it used to be before. Uh, it used to be the farmers. The, uh, it's the, the, um, the, the chain of the citizens, of the uh, importers of uh, uh, medicine, medication, uh, uh, rather than the, uh, the farmers. Also, the laborers are the beneficiaries. And also, the wholesale, uh, the wholesale actually, uh, traders or merchants are the most beneficiaries, uh, the most beneficial. It's because uh, of the uh, cooperatives also, that we have cooperatives that 
a wholesale uh, trader can be replaced by a cooperative. Also, the logistics, uh, the logistics services, uh, the technological use, it's a win-win situation, and but it varies. Uh, Mr. Barahme, uh, about uh, the contradiction, it's not a, a contradiction. Uh, for every 20 dinams, you would uh, necessitate a worker. You have you need to add another worker for an, every additional uh, one dunam of land. So it's uh, it's the uh, the Palestinian uh, land uh, authority or association uh, uh, uses more uh, technologies, uh, especially water fed land, uh, uh, which also leads to uh, increasing uh, number uh, or th hundreds of thousands of uh, workers. Maybe the need for more workers and more water. Dr. Abdurrahman, uh, speaking about uh, the water, it's not only the technocrat that you mentioned, also the intensity of the available water that is not more than 30% that we have now. So, so using a uh, technology, uh, how many water cubic water would you need for to cover the need? There are some small uh, farmers who use about 13% of the water. This is something to work on. There's, of course, uh, there's uh, the requirement of water. Dr. Tariq, the settlements, maybe Dr. Abdurrahman would be better in uh, answering this. Uh, the, from the uh, settlement maps, it is uh, there is uh, an ideological uh, dimension, but in terms of the control of the uh, Jordan Valley resources, they would not give up the uh, Jordan Valley areas or water resources. Regarding Mr. Taisir, he talked about Salam Fayyad. I, I did not, uh, it's not uh, uh, connected to the uh, economic uh, situation. We have seen a lot of achievements uh, uh, which doesn't uh, uh, mean that he didn't have mistakes. Uh, regarding the economic parallel uh, in agriculture, some of the youth efforts uh, to market or promote are good, but it's not like a calculation of data of using or uh, handling uh, tons of millions for certain activities uh, for profit. So it's, uh, it's uh, a matter of cooperatives. Thank you. There's a question. A benefiting, it's for Bayan, benefiting from the state law, the state uh, law uh, on uh, commerce or trade and finance uh, investment to challenge the Israeli colonial policies through uh, the uh, just uh, trade uh, and uh, the trade in the international market, uh, the Palestinians' relationship with the exporting. I don't know if any one of you can answer this question. So it's about the challenge, the uh, the challenge uh, Israel challenging the market using certain uh, certain using certain instruments and the Palestinian right to access the markets. Dr. Bayan, I would start with Taisir's question. Let me introduce the scope of the paper, which is to assess a general policy. We've taken the policy of the monetary authority, the banking sector only. That's why you didn't feel that it was a comprehensive or holistic one. The, um, the objective was to assess the, uh, this uh, public policy or general policy with due respect to all uh, small uh, financing uh, uh, companies. I think they are playing the role of the state. The people who work with the uh, small financing uh, uh, companies are the least uh, 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 fortunate uh, in the community. They don't have enough money. The, it's the state who should be uh, intervening here. They should not be uh, 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 taking the risks of uh, high uh, loans. We can maybe uh, argue about this, but if we look at uh, the uh, comprehensive development, uh, how can we take into to account uh, uh, micro-financing institutions. Another uh, uh, problem 
was that we can't find uh, that the banks are not ready to give loans for, to give the minimum that they should declare these loans. We worked on at a macro at a macro level and not a micro as opposed to micro level. We've taken calculated uh, data uh, uh, financing or uh, banking data, but we couldn't uh, work at the level of a bank because these data are very sensitive and nobody wants to share them. So it was difficult to access uh, the information or data. Your question, Ala uh, and Tarek question, pre-Oslo, we did not have a banking sector. We used to have Israeli banks, like Leomi, for example, bank. And uh, after the Oslo uh, agreement, we had uh, local, local banks uh, opened. Uh, banks, uh, 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 branches of uh, Arab banks, probably the missing part in the paper was not merely the liberalism and the financial finances, but also the globalization. I should have maybe talked about uh, the global globalization because these are phenomena the liberalism uh, ask for the or call for the uh, opening of uh, free trade and uh, the markets. And the trade, the uh, free trade, uh, can only be done through uh, mar uh, uh, through banks, and and oh, and open markets, uh, markets, of course, with dictation by the uh, World Bank. That is always uh, in support of the uh, authorities' uh, policies. So we should always be open to the uh, external uh, uh, trade. The uh, banks are the profitable organizations, and thus uh, there are uh, risks, there are high risks, high, high retail. When the general policy uh, set by the monetary authority, they sh it, it's, it told the banks to bring their own money uh, from abroad and have them uh, employed here uh, domestically. Uh, the banks might not like uh, uh, have uh, poli their policies uh, uh, controlled by others but on the other hand our uh, country is at high risk and therefore the banks the, the profitability of uh, the banks regarding your Barat's comment Yes, actually, the, this uh, presentation is not descriptive, but with instructions by mother, he said that I should not address, I should be uh, addressing the content. I gave you a summary, summary of using uh, a, an econometric uh, model. Sorry, the, the voice is very low. It's, it's not a descriptive paper at all. Uh, using this model is a contribution to show the causal uh, relationship between financialization and uh, uh, banking. The, uh, the load or the burden is not merely on the uh, banks alone, but if you look on the long, long run, the agricultural sector, the contribution of the agricultural sector contributed to the economy, but due to the occupation policies and the lack of support, community support and political support by the authority to the farmers, we are struggling for the land, but, but, but while we are uh, abandoning this land. So there has to be an, a government role or intervention, a role of the official banking institutions to support the farmers and the small farmers through our presence on the ground. We would not uh, lose only the quality of food, but also the, the resistance being present at the land or resilience. Regarding the surveillance, uh, uh, the monetary authority is an independent institution and not affiliated to the uh, decisions of the government. However, I think there might be a long-term uh, strategy for development. We can't tell the banks to provide the uh, money or cash flow, whereas uh, we 
and I want to, uh, we can complement this policy. You, you have to have a trend or where do you want this cash flow to go? We can also say that on the same page of the 2008 uh, public policy, we had the uh, world uh, um, money crisis. Uh, during our interview with uh, an official, he said that this uh, uh, policy was not uh, related to the uh, crisis. It was independent from the crisis and therefore directing uh, the uh, cash flow was uh, intended and not because we were trying to avoid it. I think this is enough. The rest of the uh, questions are for you, Ala, about China. Thank you. Regarding the question on China, I'm not an expert uh, in uh, uh, Chinese uh, economy, but from my, my understanding, I'm not an expert in the international policies, but uh, of course, uh, China is one of these uh, elements or central pillars of uh, the so-called uh, neoliberal economy of the uh, world today, in the world today. It's difficult uh, to handle this as a challenge between uh, the emperors, the empires, or states, or countries. This is not uh, our uh, topic here, but it's in the com to uh, the competition or to provide something to the world or to benefit from this uh, uh, industrial uh, competition among the uh, um, empires today. I we have two questions. One by Miss uh, Lina, Lina Buderi, regarding uh, the uh, development of education. I think yesterday's uh, meeting uh, with. Uh, with Dr. Bshara Domani, president of the university, uh, talked about the uh, development of edu university education and its relation with the economic, with the political economy. Uh, there is a, a comment, uh, an important comment by by Dr. Basim Zubaydi uh, about conclusions conclusions of this panel. on the relation uh, of uh, this with the national uh, project, which is uh, summarizing her sign with Abdurrahman, Jamil, and Bayan, summarizing it to the limits of West Bank and Gaza Strip. And here there's a question on the national uh, indemption, if you wish, or Redemption, sorry, and, uh, and so I saw a model that analyzes Palestine with the 1967 borders. I am really uh, happy uh, that uh, I am in good control of the session. We we'll take a break for 15 minutes to go to the next session.
So if uh, so if if it worked, it it means uh, that there will be um, a, a very big distance between the liberation concept and the revolution concept. This is where a big uh, difference uh, is says that with there is no real revolution before any revolution, and especially if it started to get into uh, and swallow the whole national project, and if it was an impact of any copy of other projects, even if before the liberation project. Maybe. It's no, no need to say that it might be exaggerated to say that some symbolism could be used in different contexts. So the victory sign or symbol would be used in, in case of, uh, instead of uh, referring to the uh, desire of the liberation desire, it would become um, an accomplishment in itself, even if it was an election of a society that is uh, uh, to do with um, egg uh, production. So victory is what leads to production. This is where we can say that we are in front of a situation that is called historic and in order to set things in their normal context. Uh, today, we meet with us uh, three researchers who have uh, uh, done some important comparatives and in-depth analysis about uh, move movements, starting with the um, Arab movement in uh, passing by uh, uprising that did not even leave an impact or emulation since the uh, Al Buraka um, uprise, and and then to the p final paper about intellectuals in universities and ac academics. So we expect uh, that through this in this session to uh, uh, to discuss uh, political economy uh, and and the relationships that are included within the uh, formal and informal actors and mo movements and so on. We uh, welcome in this session uh, the researcher, the uh, Tunisian uh, researcher Nisaf. Barahmi, who would present to us a paper um, um, uh, titled The Palestinian Coast of the Arab Street. We welcome her um, warmly, especially that uh, our uh, 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 green uh, sister Tunisia is still evolving its history away from uh, Abu Azizi. So welcome to you, Dr. Anik uh, and Asaf. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And she's checking if we hear her well. Thank you very much, uh, and I hope uh, we will be face to face in uh, future uh, meetings. Uh, welcome you from Tunisia, and and my paper is about. Okay, so she's checking in about the quality of voice. Uh, yes, hello.
Welcome to you all. Um, okay. So what about she's checking the voice? However, I can hear her very well. Okay. Thank you very much. So, so uh, this paper is about the uh, presence of the Palestinian Kurds and the Arab uh, street in the, after the, uh, the intifadas and revolutions and uprising that have. So, as I said, uh, this paper uh, will address especially the um, uh, presence of the Palestinian Kurds in the Arab street after the revolutions and intifadas and movements of uh, Arab that have increased that way that swept the Arab countries and most of the region because after the different movements that have happened uh, there were questions that have uh, arose uh, regarding the Arab Kurds and questions about its presence and about uh, its prospect and how much uh, it's present and the, the previous uh, people's interest in, in this as it was the the, the uh, so I will I will distribute this paper into two parts. The first is we'll discuss um, the uh, the case on the official uh, uh, presence on the uh, of the Arab world, and then the um, official media to some of the countries in order not to be generalized. Uh, and in the second part, I will discuss the presence, the big presence of the Palestinian case in the movements of the Arab uh, street and uh, and it's uh, the continuation of its presence uh, uh, despite all the hindrances uh, since 2011 up till today and 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 I can say it was in some uh, 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 times it was the main cause in the Arab street of course I don't want to generalize there are differences between the different countries and there are differences in the Arab street uh, regarding the concern and interest uh, in, in this case. So regarding the first part, uh, which is uh, the um, uh, 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 absence of the issue on the official level uh, in the Arab regimes, uh, as you all know, uh, there are new uh, waves of Arab normalization uh, with, uh, with uh, Israel. But the uh, current wave, which uh, was, uh, and I, I need here to refer to that the Palestinian case is always linked to the transform trans transfer um, uh, strategic and basic transformations in, in the area and the region and in the world, especially after the uh, rise uh, uh, or the, uh, after the uh, right wing um, in uh, and like Trump. So it was always linked to this uh, uh, wave of the uh, populism um, uh, trend in the, in the Arab world, in the uh, uh, international world. So this normalization was led by uh, UAE and uh, Bahrain. And, and, and I can say it's also uh, led by countries that uh, support the, the opposing uh, revolutions where uh, there were revolutions. So it's it, this is there, and and we can see it clearly. I would like here to refer that these waves uh, differ from the previous uh, waves Be, since the uh, uh, normalizing country do not have uh, uh, presence as if uh, they, they weren't uh, any any time at war with uh, with the Israel, neither UAE or uh, Bahrain or Morocco or even Sudan. They were far from. And the occupying uh, 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 try to motivate and uh, to, to, to get these new normalizations. Uh, of course, we cannot forget uh, that all this uh, is linked to
So these uh, normalizing weights are uh, very much linked uh, to. Uh, they were motivated by uh, or driven by political um, uh, um, factors and. and were driven by other factors uh, they're not limited only to uh, that uh, they're in war and that's why that was their motivation and that's why they've signed agreements with the occupying uh, country but or state but they've uh, the uh, military is the uh, alliance in order to oppose iran so iran became the first enemy in the arab uh, world uh, And, and this uh, new uh, tr tr uh, um, uh, wave uh, was uh, in line with Trump's uh, um, uh, uh, deal because it's it's the first or the significant in liquefying the Palestinian case and all the agreements uh, that were um, a, a, a normalization or all forms of uh, normalization. Uh, uh, like for instance, uh, Sudan uh, had uh, uh, have uh, they've removed uh, 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 Khartoum from the uh, uh, from the um, terrorist uh, list, and and also all this have taken into consideration. In addition, uh, these countries um, are, um, I believe, uh, 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 very bad because. Uh, 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 and they were not hidden. Uh, and they were proud uh, of their, of their uh, agreements that they've uh, conducted and, and um, uh, official uh, media has uh, celebrated uh, these agreements, uh, for instance, in Oro Morocco. Although in some cases the uh, Moroccan public uh, rejected this agreement, so all, or how to call it, all these, the new context that uh, started uh, characterizing or surrounding the Palestinian cause, I believe they are not the best uh, to remove the Palestinian uh, cause from the Arab streets, although there are new internal uh, 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 contexts, but I, I can't say that this is uh, specific to Tunis or Morocco. But the Palestinian cause has always been there with the public. And here I move to the next part of the paper, which is the presence of the Palestinian cause, especially at the uh, popular uh, activism and alternative media, because we cannot ignore the alternative media today. I cannot say that because it was strongly uh, uh, available in all the activism. Because as you know, the Arab area has witnessed uh, uh, events, uh, quality events, if you wish, destruction in some countries. So, nations or people care and we cannot say we will, we will care for the Palestinian cause without caring for the internal situation because in Tunis there are different periods of time that, that there is the period where there was a great conflict where the focus was on, mostly on uh, these internal events in other times with more uh, ability. There was uh, uh, solidarity during the Nakba and then they were with the Palestinians. 
So events cannot uh, be, uh, uh, cannot pass unnoticed in Tunis. And sometimes even there are no demonstrations with the Palestinian people. So for me, I cannot say the Palestinian cause is absent because the Arab nations, by nature, they will express their need to work for dignity and political uh, liberties and freedom. But this comes as part of uh, the activism in support for the Palestinian cause. So the Palestinian cause is always there. From the start of the revolution, there are events that uh, uh, were evidently uh, or evident, and it was occupying the public opinion, such as in recent elections. 2019, there was a great space in the electoral campaign uh, to, uh, to uh, reject normalization. And I can say there are individuals who made their decision in the presidential elections after a TV debate with the current president, Ayed, and his competitor, because there was a question on normalization and there was a great rejection, although I consider it was more of a slogan to bring more votes from those in solidarity with the Palestinian people. Nonetheless, it was there. Also, we cannot forget that in several cases, in any sport event or cultural event, the discussion was there around the Palestinian cause in Tunis and in the Arab uh, uh, public discourse. An Algerian uh, sportsman uh, refused to compete with an Israeli competitor. And so the discussion, again, was brought to the forefront. Are we with uh, normalization or is normalization a uh, territory? So the Palestinian cause has never been in a detachment from the Arab uh, issues. On the contrary, uh, it was uh, very close to the internal issues. It was not separate, because uh, oppression is one, and suffering is one. When we uh, fight against oppression in Tunis, then we have to do the same in Palestine. So I'm still having a short paragraph where I speak about the role of alternative media. Because I see now, uh, out of the uh, reasons that some did say that, who allege that the Palestinian cause is not that uh, present, is that much present in the Arab media. But in the social media, I see that in the social media, it was used. I mean, uh, they use the social media websites and the Palestinian national struggle and in expressing support, uh, solidarity all the time with the Palestinian rights. Uh, and in the last uh, uh, revolution or uh, uprising of Sheikh Jarrah showed that how much the Arab people through the social media uh, showed that was interested in what's happening uh, in Palestine. Especially on Facebook, uh, it was this much around 24 million people change their profile photo. I know this is symbolic and does not have direct effect on the uh, conflict and the in reality, the Palestinian conflict. Nonetheless, there was that campaign with, in solidarity with the Palestinian prisoners on hunger strike. 24 people in the Arab region changed their profile photo. 
uh, where the prisoner are uh, blindfolded uh, with uh, wearing the Israeli prison uh, uniform. I don't say this is important, but it carries the voices of the uh, Palestinian prisoners to the world almost in a much better way compared to the uh, traditional uh, mainstream media. So the Palestinian cause has always been there in the social media, which I consider as a platform in uh, educating more about the Palestinian right and revealing the real states of the occupation. So I believe the Arab nations are still engaged in uh, solidarity campaigns. And the great uh, major digital uh, campaigns and the campaigns on the ground that will be, as I said before, are connected with other uh, national events. To sum up, in spite of the normalization campaigns and in spite of the uh, official media that continues shocking us with uh, words such as we cannot be more Palestinians than the Palestinians themselves in defending their cause, and every nation uh, should take care of its uh, issues. No, the uh, Palestinian cause is still present in the Arab uh, uh, public. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you for your intervention. We will uh, defer the questions to the last thing. Thank you for commenting to the time. Now, we take the next paper presented by Abud Hamayel, as he prefers to be called. He is a PhD researcher interested in resistance movements in their international and Palestinian context and the concept of resistance titled An Uprising Without Organization. The floor is yours. Thank you, Wasim. And I would like to thank uh, Muwatan and Dr. Mudar Qastis for allowing us this uh, opportunity, and I'd like to thank Joyce, Anna, and all researchers who contributed to uh, this uh, conference, and Mr. Mudar for the uh, telephone discussions and trying to uh, uh, develop this paper. This paper, I must confess that I have uh, rewritten uh, it three times. I wrote it first time before three years. I continued omitting, rewriting it several times. Every time I, I tried to write something about the uprising of operations that took place in 2015, I always face a real crisis on how to understand this action. Because in spite of everything, all these control regimes, if you wish, and matrices, we get an action that seeks to overcome them. And we have spent a long time, this conference, speaking of the reality in trying to understand why we cannot achieve what we want to achieve. And at the end of the day, uh, uh, liberate ourselves from the occupation and this description that we are trying to do, the PA, Oslo, uh, Washington Consensus, and all these operations that are fought, they meet with the will of individuals coordinating with themselves to uh, overcome the situation. So always the question has been there, not only what makes a person, we as Palestinians, it's clear to us what makes a person to resist. There is no need to analyze it further analysis. But why people get this uh, moment of a trigger 
to uh, 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 get away from all this deterrence matrix that is there, as mentioned by Dr. Mudar in his first intervention, how this tactic comes up, although the rule of the game is built by the colonialism and how they overcome the oversight, the monitoring, and the lack of trust in the society and the bureaucracies that have inflated in the last 20 years in the Palestinian context and reorganizing, re-engineering the Palestinian society to be based on uh, foreign aid and connected with the PA structure, how this action starts and why uh, at that time. So I always so I tried to consider this action. It did not come up from that single individual and it's over. It is. Uh, it comes in uh, as uh, waves and uh, in succession. So much that many Zionist research that try to understand this action, they say having one action increases chances uh, by 250% for the occurrence of a next action. And how we met this action, like, these operations, which was called individual, there is a great problem in analyzing them and having an individual concept. Uh, uh, what do you mean by individual? Individual operation, is it from individual uh, incentive or is it individual because it's not connected with an organization that did not plan it? And why do we call it as individual? Although in the Palestinian context, there is always continuous action that is not launched by a uh, cluster or organizational context. There were actions that resulted or led uh, the organizations to believe that people, they want this action, such as the first and second intifadas. With these organizations that try to coordinate efforts and build different roles and uh, divide these roles and then try to build tactics and strategies for confrontation with the population. So why do we call it individual? Or who called it so? In my view, this uh, uh, term individual is wrong and shallow because the uh, construction of this action is social. This violent interaction uh, with the occupier is, uh, especially on the roads, uh, the bypass roads in the West Bank and bus stops, and here the imagination has a central role to play in forming this uh, and formulating this action because the imagination is what prepares for this action it connects between the dream on how I overcome this system. Sometimes action can play a role to escape from reality, but sometimes it creates the reality or seeks to intervene with the reality when the imagination transforms into action, then this action is preceded by this imagination, which collectively can be with many people where there is an arms when meeting an armed soldier or the symbolics of this PA uh, or this authority with all these watchtowers and cameras. So this uh, uh, starts a spontaneously, uh, spontaneous way in the West Bank mostly. So this was the attempt to understand why this action took place. And at the same time, into uh, Acknowledge that there are social chains in the Palestinian society uh, where the uh, action explains it. So it's more of a automated this action. Yes, it is a collect, basically, it is a social collective thing. How we got it, it is collective, but also there is this dancing from this pre organization and orchestrating the con and other contexts. So how this happened, to make it uh, automated, I don't want to get into this because I noticed there are several papers discussing this in a way or another, political economy, the issue of authority, bureaucracy. But I'd like to say that we have a great inflation on how we diagnose our crisis. 
we have a political division crisis. We have a crisis of a lack of a a action. It is inaction. Crisis of organization. A crisis of cooperation with colonialism as a case produced by colonialist settlement by some groups trying to save themselves or to get some privilege at the uh, expense of the code or the society or in, at the expense of the pursuit for liberation. We have several crises, we all the time speak of them. So in my view, this action and other actions that followed This action is an attempt to overcome this situation. It is an attempt to overcome the reality. Yes, the action uh, builds on certain ground, but tries to overcome uh, or to bypass it. So when we ask what to do, we need to see how people try to solve this problem, how the society tries to find solutions for this reality. So studying the action comes from here. So not only to understand the mechanisms of the action, but to see how people try to overcome different crises. Here, we, uh, we are met with the crisis of leadership. In the last 20 years, we have been facing a problem, an issue of leadership. I mean, who leads and who makes strategies who, who builds organization, especially that in the Palestinian context that we are living. So leadership is practically an organizational structure to combat uh, uh, disobedience or insurgency. So this inflation in the PA bureaucracy the uh, uh, establishment of market and its expansion and the class polarization as a result of that, all these processes are structures for social roles division within a certain political organizational hierarchy division, which is there to uh, combat insurgency or to prevent uh, resistance action. And this is commodification for this, uh, commodification for political inaction. And it's not only inaction, it's action in preventing resistance. And I shouldn't speak a lot about it, because our basic crisis is the transformation in the Palestinian elite from resistance, especially in the national uh, uh, movement, uh, this does not apply to all the Palestinian uh, uh, military uh, organizations, but in the national movement, it is the transformation of this movement into a regime for cooperation with the uh, uh, colonialism and uh, a national disguise. And in my idea, the, uh, the rise of the action uh, coincides with the... Uh, with the fall of this allegation, the ability of the PA to convince us that it is building a state, this imagination that it rejected with the rebuilding of the PA after during the Fayyad time when the EU and World Bank said Palestine practically is ready to be a state. So now we need to sit with the Israelis and see how the state will, will look like and finish off. But gradually, it turned up intentionally or not intentionally that this situation that we are living is a, a, a reproduced one by the PA and it is permanent with all these crises such as the salary crisis and other crises that continue with the bureaucracy, which is part of uh, 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 conformity or obedience to this authority as uh, uh, an agent for uh, cooperating with the occupation and for the sustainability of the settlement expansion in our country. But after 2012, this is uh, uh, going away. We see the uh, uh, resistance uh, action started coming up 2012, 2014, 
not uh, intensive, but it is gradual. And the peak of this action was in 2015, especially in October. And this is where the uh, operations, the automated operations started. The peak with Muhannad al-Halabi, who did a resistance action, and Tariq al-Wad road in uh, Jerusalem after the martyrdom uh, of uh, his uh, colleague, Riyad Talahmi, on Khursa town near Dura. So here comes the importance of this research to discuss the role of friendship and establishing action. The incubators of love and lust in uh, formulating action, not only as revenge. Sometimes when a friend uh, uh, is martyred, martyred, it reminds us of our ability to make, to take the same action. So heroism is not something sacred away from my hand, but it is uh, I, uh, upon, with my, within my reach. So the succession of the uh, operations, as rem we remember these were friends, or relatives, or brothers, people from uh, near social incubators, uh, near to the action, and they uh, repeat the same uh, action. At the same time, this doesn't, mean, uh, uh, this doesn't mean that there is no revenge. So this succession shows that there is a close or intimate social basis for that. So maybe the central point in the intensive action 2015, 2016, the waves that followed, this action remains there with two parts. The part that is kind of surprising to the uh, relaxed control uh, matrices that is relaxed and feeling that it is all well and comfortable after dismantling the organizations and arrest of political opponents of the PA and uh, re-controlling the most, if you wish, and destroying many charities and the ability to take organizational action, which became comfortable for all these uh, organizations. So this action develops and there is no solution for that. One of the strange paradoxes is that when you look at the research by, uh, 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 especially Zionist uh, insurgency combat uh, researchers, they try to find the origin of this action. When it comes, I can, they try to, uh, to uh, be preemptive, but they are unable to do so. From where they get this action, this resistance action? There are several answers. One of the important answers among the Zionists is that the problem is in the social media, Facebook and social media, because this social media is uh, forming a new way for individuals to communicate, to publish songs, photographs, and remind with the historical heroism of the Palestinian people and reproduce it currently to be uh, ready for that. And so there was a need for uh, intervention into this space, not only in terms of closing uh, uh, accounts, but as a security institution, they believe that they need to have a presence in social media. And you notice there are different uh, 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 pages for the Israeli side trying to uh, uh, to tell sometimes explicitly uh, revealing their identity, sometimes not, and also the Israeli civil administration are doing the same work. So they are trying to uh, uh, get a space on this virtual space. They had an, another type of intervention by the Zionists that is to prevent action by uh, uh, making some deterrences in the different spaces, such as at the bus stops, they would make some barriers to prevent uh, car ramming or to uh, station soldiers at the bus stop after the shooting operations and killing soldiers after Asim al barghuti they gave the soldiers another engineering intervention 
so much that at the uh, uh, where Asim Barghouti near Ramallah, where he did his uh, operation, they made uh, a steel barrier at the bus stop where they can peek from a short, a small window, and the settlers objected to that. But the reading that if I cannot prevent action by uh, accessing the information before that, then I need to cut off the uh, uh, the imagination itself. Like to cut off their ability to imagine that they can do this operation. So this is an intervention to cut off the imagination. Another group of interventions that we can speak of was in 2016, where the donors are uh, uh, paying their money, especially in Jerusalem. A lot of money was there, but they stopped. I don't uh, see any causal relation, but at least there are types of uh, relation between the action itself and uh, especially in Jerusalem area, pumping these funds by donors. And other attempts to, uh, that are basically connected to uh, engineering the friction points other than the funds and militarization and so forth, which is an attempt to prevent uh, having any future organization of this action. The central concern among all the Zionist research is that, okay, this action, we might control it, it comes and goes, we cannot anticipate it, but this, the new well, should not turn or develop into organized action. It should not uh, uh, turn into organization where people can organize their efforts and harmonize their efforts in challenging the existing regime. So this was important, especially in the important events such as Ayn Bobin operation, where it turned out that there was some form of organization in spite of the attempts to prevent building this organization. Hence comes this tough reaction, like from where this military organization, even from, even uh, such a small one while we are we're too busy in preventing the building of the uh, uh, military uh, political organization that builds tactics and provides resources. And what is important here that it can set the time, like the organization not only relies on spontaneous action that comes and goes, but sometimes it can set the time and be a proactive and make intervention in the history course of that. So this was one of the important things. I'm not left with much time. I have a lot to say, but I'll try to say an important thing. First, two things. One of the things that prevent the development of organizations is an important thing, which is there is a decay in political trust. I can say the political trust, if we can to sit together and coordinate our efforts, there is a crisis in that, a real crisis. And this has a history. And this shows how much we have different, how many uh, different forms for cooperation with the uh, occupation, like a traitor, a uh, a spy, a uh, normalizer, and different terminologies, a security coordination, all these forms, the, the inflation of these terminologies makes us feel that the informer is everywhere, the agent is everywhere. It's in my pocket, in my smartphone, in every meeting, even if the person that I'm meeting is not an informant, but maybe in the prison he might uh, confess against them. This prevents people sitting together. 
because people they need to feel some security. So the phone, there is another form of uh, censorship that the Israeli side build on that. This is how we produce ourselves as data in this virtual space of how much telephones we carry and other forms of entering this data. So the problem in censorship for the Israelis is not the scarcity, but the uh, uh, large amount of data that they need to analyze and build uh, on that, on how to act from in a security uh, perspective. Because there is a great flow of this surplus of data. So these two factors, as if the informant or informer is everywhere, this is a feeling, not necessarily it is there, the shadow of spy uh, or informer, and this colonialist censorship prevents building organizations, especially in areas that can easily be stormed and arrested, where they can be arrested. You don't have places where you can commit small mistakes without uh, being uh, uh, facing uh, penalties by the different security services. So we have this major issue, which is important to understand a third dimension and about to finish, which is the issue of history, organization in Palestine, the pain in making organization. People tried and they keep, uh, they keep uh, warning, uh, warning us. So I hate this word, but our peers, they say, okay, we learned our lesson, so you learn your lesson. And this created a new type of organization that does not need this direct communication between people, which is based on the image, on the memory, on the succession of action, on a role model, and building a speech, especially by those who committed uh, uh, the action, the leadership, people uh, mastered, were mastered and wrote, such as Baha'u'llah and, and Basil Arab and other martyrs. Not necessarily they wrote, but they were educated, but they wrote criticism against the really Palestinian reality, including uh, the youth was, who was not martyred in Cuba. I believe his name is Abed, yes. So, he wrote something about uh, using this knife, and he said uh, these uh, firearms could fire horizontally. So this organization that we are speaking about is uh, that mixes between the virtual and the real, and your ability to in the reality uh, with through what your imagination prepares for, and with the support uh, through historical awareness. And last point is the impact of this action that we can see at different levels. There were no Bab uh, al-Asbat uh, uh, without al Jabbarin sons, and Dab Hatta also uprising that took to the streets. And we can speak about the popular uprisings in Jerusalem, and so, like in Ramadan and Asbat. But basically, this uprising basically in Jerusalem this has brought more attention to these streets and created a more uh, tense relation with the police uh, in the old uh, Jerusalem and around it, and led to mistakes by the Israeli police and others which played an important role in forming the popular political uh, bloc. So this is not easy. This is uh, its impact on regaining action and uh, uh, initiative and also the ability to impact on building clear political blocks. Thank you. I finished. Thank you. Thank you, Abud, for this rich presentation. There will be a discussion in a while on the conclusions and the content. Now we receive on Zoom Dr. Roger Hickok. 
اهلا وسهلا بدكتور روجر هيكوك اهلا بك وهو ابن جامعه He's a Beers State University graduate. He loved it and it loved him. He's uh, abroad now. Dr. Roger is an international fighter and uh, interested in the Palestinian cause and the contemporary history. We would be listening to his presentation or paper on the uh, revolution of the revolutions, uh, the absence of intellectuals, please. First, uh, I would like to welcome Muatan Salamat Lil Jumhur audience. Uh, also, I would like to salute my friends and colleagues in, at this platform, at this uh, symbolic platform, mainly Ms. Mr. Aboud, who, who wrote with me the thesis, a special thesis on the second uprising, which reminds me of the optimism, the big optimism, which I feel with the intellectuals, with the neo-intellectuals as a future of Palestine and the area and to the world, despite all the criticism that I would be doing now in this uh, lecture, which I will be uh, presenting in English. Cease, who suggested that I give a talk in this conference by speaking about then versus now, the past and the present, not just Fernand Brodel's also uh, immediate time, also his social, or generational time several decades ago. Mudar reminded me that I had told him of discussions at Birzeit during the turning point of the early 1990s. I decided it was a good idea if I managed to contrast that before, 30 years ago, with today's after. And if that contrast held any potential lessons for the future. I do think there may be something in that regard. This talk addresses an audience of largely Palestinian intellectuals. The term has two meanings. The first is the brilliant insight of Antonio Gramsci, who discovered that everybody is an intellectual, since part of our lives whoever we may be, is idea-driven and even idea-determined. The second is the more formal definition, linking intellectuals to spoken, but really written knowledge production and consumption. But I like Jean-Paul Sartre's definition best, whereby intellectuals are those who meddle in what is not their business. In this sense, all Palestinians have within the generational past been intellectuals, never minding only their own business as individuals and always their collective business as people seeking freedom and self-determination and combating colonial rule. The traditional ethos of Palestinians was during the last third of the 20th century, somewhat akin to Ibn Khaldun's Asabiya, that communal energy binding the people together in one collective drive. Of course, this ethos did not exclude divisions and sometimes deadly internal conflict an integral part of that asabiya. There was strident competition between groups, factions, parties. But the sense of inner cohesion was palpable, and it became manifest in the 1987 Intifada, when the transgenerational interclass crowd, including women and men, boys and girls, rose up and forced 
the occupier onto the defensive. All Palestinians were intellectuals, but within that ensemble, there was nonetheless an intelligentsia based on the young, inexperienced, but very energetic universities, and who assumed and were gladly granted leadership status by the rest of the society, while of course, never ceasing to recognize the authority of the Palestine Liberation Organization. Students and faculty led the Intifada for five years. During that time, global events were accelerating and hugely transformative. The Soviet Union collapsed and disappeared. The Arab world imploded with the first Gulf War and negotiations began in Madrid and continued in Washington, in which again, the Palestinian intelligentsia played a major role. At Birzeit, the same global, regional, and local transition was reflected. And Birzeit, and the other universities, of course, but I speak of what I know, went through its own transition. Here, let us go from the macrocosm to the microcosm, hopefully without losing sight of the gigantic scale on which these events were playing out. Prior to the 1990s, my department at Birzeit included history, geography, political science, archaeology, all together as a sim single department on the old campus, and the old campus was itself scattered across the entire village of Birzeit, of which it was an integral part. And this point becomes important in my conclusion. This unity was symbolic, although also necessary due to lack of staff, funds, expertise. And indeed, the academic disciplines were less clear cut politics being their common denominator, as was the prestige value attributed to them, at least within the humanities and social sciences. The literacy program, Mahu al was high on the list for importance, as was the 1948 destroyed villages, al Qura al-Mudammara project of the research and documentation Center, center. Cultural studies, Dirasat Thakafiya, modeled after the program of the American University of Beirut, was ubiquitous. It lasted two years, and the smartest, brightest, most intelligent staff members, whether foreign or Palestinian, taught and fought in that department in which Marxism was hegemonic. Voluntary work, a requirement then and now, was considered subversive by the occupier who deported the mayor of Albire for organizing it. And thus it was undertaken as a project directly linked to liberation. And the most motivated students, with some exceptions, still flocked to the arts faculty. When students and staff went home, they returned to their village, their refugee camp, their hara, where they lived alongside the rest of the society from where they fought the good fight. The transitional era at Birzeit began with the arrival in 1992 of Ibrahim Abulohud in the country, coming from Chicago, in the country and the university. He had been appointed vice president and took on his job with great vigor, centralizing a great deal of power in his hands. In his new task, he did not hesitate for a minute. It was a veritable rupture with past practices. He immediately put an end to the endless anti-occupation, university closures and strikes, opening wide the gates and decreeing that staff and students should attend regularly. 
Incidentally, this became required practice during the second intifada. With the reopening, we were all isolated in the new campus by military order, a significant change as well. The occupier had experienced the insurrection of stones in the streets of Birzit village. And soon Abu Lorod established the Graduate Studies Committee, made up of 10 or so people from different faculties and departments, but no women yet, and began to create graduate programs over the resistance of some of the now temporarily marginalized brilliant founders of the university who felt that we did not have the academic capacity to teach graduate programs without at the very least destroying the quality of the undergraduate ones. And who from today's vantage point can say they were wrong, although within a few years they had changed their mind, adapted and largely taken over the process. Abu Lohud proceeded to put international studies, law, and then community health, as the public and community health program was then called, to put them on the table, followed by others. Within a year or two, these had been approved and began to operate. But the discussions over these programs had been tense and polarized. One view was that Palestine and Palestinians needed to adapt to the new post-Soviet world of free enterprise, free trade, free circulation, and become part of a globalized, interconnected universe. This, for those arguing on behalf of the Law Institute and faculty, encouraged and financially endowed by a Western country, meant creating first and foremost a program in economic and specifically trade law which would empower the new Palestine to maneuver on the international scale, becoming the new Arab Singa Singapore, Singapore. The other side argued that no, the law program and institute needed to specialize in international law, which would provide Palestine with tools to fight the asymmetrical conflict against the Israeli occupier in the absence of matching physical force. The argument became vehement and drawn out. In international studies, the question raised was, do we want to have an academically oriented program which teaches interdisciplinary analysis, history, politics, law, economics, thus providing students and faculty with a profounder perspective or do we want to offer a framework in which to train future Palestinian diplomats and administrators? A course in administration was added and has only recently been eliminated. As for public health, there were also a variety of now obscured conflicts which arose. The one I best remember took place on the margins of this graduate studies committee and had to do with funding. At the time, the Ford Foundation, Wasserset Ford, was a major funder of the community health program, and some questioned whether dependence on that source was not a potential surrender to the forces of imperialism. Difficult to imagine today, but that argument was front and center at a certain point in time. Let these three examples suffice in illustrating the truly transitional nature of that long past period of the early 90s. The tendency to shift from ideology, from the practice of theory, a combination of Marxism, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, third worldism, to the adaptation of practice was clearly underway as reflected in these vehement quarrels among academics. These arguments of a transitional era period were won in general by the forces of the postmodern, post-Cold War, globalized world, and lost by those wedded to ideologies 
based on socialism versus capitalism, the world versus the West, the North versus the South. And those taking place in the Graduate Studies Committee heralded the end in September 1993 of the Intifada, the arrival of the US-centered New International Order, and Nidham al alami al-Jadid, short-lived in the political arena with the rise of China, but here to stay in the economic field. Late capitalism, still with us today. This process was underway globally and also in Palestine, with the emergence of a new form of class cleavage and the globalized Palestinian bourgeoisie so brilliantly captured by Liza Taraki, among others, that bourgeoisie, or let's say more modestly, the new Palestinian middle class, had members in the various professions, law, journalism, medicine, commerce, banking, and including, of course, the universities. Our salaries began to rise steeply for reasons linked to the competition of NGOs, consultancies, ministries in the Palestinian Authority, but also the late capitalist value system in which high, uh, higher education was identified with the technological and digital revolution and post-industrial development. Our places of residence moved from the center of Ramallah to the outskirts, Atire, Surda, Abu Qash, the nearby villages acquired a hybrid, fusional quality, deconstructed as rural centers, now partly serving as commuting homes for the middle classes. We became geographically as well as socially and professionally segregated from the rest of the society. I am talking about academics as a group. There are exceptions, of course, but even these exceptions form part of the rule in any complex system. I do not suggest there is a single, simple cause and effect relationship here, but to be sure, with this change, the intelligentsia lost its position at the forefront of the political movement, and in particular, the resistance to occupation and colonization, which, of course, it continued to support unanimously. The inner tensions continued during the period leading up to the Second Intifada, which was preceded, and I would argue, partially caused by the polarization, istiqtab, between the urban middle class, for example, in Ramallah or Nablus, and the periphery, al Amari and Balata camps, dominated by constant tension and occasional bursts of violence, the Intifada of 2000 was most certainly an uprising against colonial rule, but also against a corrupt, unresponsive, privileged Palestinian authority and its constituent elements. In this polarized world, the universities were internally divided, conflicted, and most certainly lost their leading role. That has continued ever since. The rebellious waves, for example, in 2005 and thereafter in Jerusalem, as noted by Abu Hamaya, are here, I just heard, are conducted by individuals from a variety of backgrounds, whether or not they are unemployed, actively supported by members of certain professions, I would add, in, and in which I would include journalists, media, a few, including international media, some, human rights NGOs, some, lawyers, some, but not by universities as institutions, nor by their faculty, staff, and students as bodies. And I am not speaking of the many members of the intelligentsia who as individuals have participated over the past 20 years. What has happened over the past generation for universities in particular, and the intelligentsia in general, can be seen in the context of the autocratic model described by Machiavelli in the discourses. 
where he convincingly argues against it and in favor of republicanism for precisely this reason, the isolation of the leadership. The intelligentsia has collectively been able to choose between the authority on the one hand or a form of comfortable internal exile far from the burning issues of the day in the domestic political field. Nobody countenances expansionist Zionism, of course, but there is much less of a telling internally directed critique which would in turn stiffen external resistance. The intelligentsia has largely separated itself from the popular base, no longer exercises its influence over the people, nor undergoes their influence. And they have thus, as a group, marginalized themselves in the continuing movement of resistance and for liberation. This could be seen in the various revolutionary waves of the past decade up to and including last spring and summer. I would add that Marwan Tarazi's admirable report, admirable report on school and universal edu university education shows that the result of these 30 years has not been a particularly positive one within the educational sector taken separately either. Despite all the graduate programs we created, the new schools and universities, the possibilities offered to study abroad, the network of private and public schools, the enlightened administrations. What possible solutions are there to bring the intelligentsia back into the fold and thus go back to the Gramscian situation where everybody can be said to be an intellectual? One, following Pierre Bourdieu, with his remarkable outline of the theory of practice based on Algeria during the Liberation War, during its Liberation War, let us single out the importance of habitus, el bia. Habitus guarantees resilience over the long term. It once favored solidarity, uh, solidarity and cohesion. It now favors dislocation and alienation. We witness in the cities of the West Bank ever greater geographically class-based segregation. The traditionally narrow differences between classes have grown. Change can be brought about locally, can be brought about, with strong principles of social mixing in city planning and construction. There should be an end to residential self-isolation in the quest for a renewed, stable form of habitus. It requires strong arguments and hard work on the part of the citizens. There are municipal councils, the baladiat, and city planners, and who knows, even the Ministry of Local Government, if enough pressure is brought to bear. Two, the composition of the Palestinian intelligentsia was at the end of the last century much more culturally diverse, a diversity sorely missing today. Many Birzeit staff members, as well as members of the Palestinian professions, were graduates from the Soviet Union or East European universities. They were trained in the kind of egalitarian, progressive, universalistic values and letters largely absent from US and British graduate programs. And I would add from Soviet practice needless to say, thus adding much greater diversity and power to the prevailing discourse in which activism for reform, including revolution, in, additional to an essential, in addition to an essential comparative perspective, placed Palestine in its global setting. Three, intellectuals are by definitions agents of the noose in Greek, the mind, practitioners of the nomos, law, but they do not hear, participate in rule, with some exceptions. Nowadays, they mind their own business. This does not apply to every member of the intelligentsia, but to intelli intellectuals as a group, now a separate caste. And therefore, 
they have as a group become marginal in the continuing movement of resistance for liberation. I have here indicated the roots of that progressive distancing. The behavior of the intelligentsia collectively can make a difference, not only or mainly the exilic intelligentsia, nor across the line in 48 Palestine, but the intelligentsia which is subjected also the intelligentsia which is subjected to the dual constraints of Israel and the Palestinian Authority. They could make a huge difference. They could force the resignation of ministers and governments. Universities could play an active role by banning from the campus those members of the authority who have become involved or complicit in murder, torture, and imprisonment of citizens. They played such a role during the five or six years of Oslo before 2000. Why couldn't they do it again? And barring that, they could force some incremental changes in policies by way, for example, of reducing geographic segregation. This without minimizing, on my part, the problems of divisions between the West Bank, Gaza, Fatah, Hamas, etc., etc. Each member of the intelligentsia could do their part. We could follow the example of Ibrahim Abulohud in the personal field. His priority was to imagine in practice the reunification of all Palestine. He did it in his daily life, constantly bringing together people from Gaza, 48 Palestine, Jerusalem, the West Bank, and exilic ones like himself, never recognizing the divisions imposed by settler colonialism. And he did what he needed to do in order to perform his work. Israel prevented him from traveling to Gaza because they said he had applied for a Palestinian ID, Hawiye, Palestinian. And as soon as you do that, you're barred from going to Gaza, even way back then. No problem. He left the country, went back to the United States, changed his name on his passport, slipped right back into the country, the whole country, effortlessly with the name, the new name, Ibrahim Lohot. He worked, in other words, on the personal and the universal all at once, on the micro and the macro. The point is, in conclusion, there are no problems, only solutions. Hopes are pinned on the younger generation of intellectuals who have the skills, the energy, the motivation, the drive, and the capacity they must be trusted to effect a reconciliation with society at large in the quest for a renewed leadership role so badly needed in the unfolding all-Palestine struggle for freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roger. We're, uh, uh Sorry for the, uh, we don't have enough time, but uh, we have uh, some questions uh, before the break. There are some arrangements uh, that we have to deal with. Only three questions. We'll take only three questions, please. And uh, we apologize for uh, uh, our uh, speakers or for the participants, uh, uh, virtual participants. We might have, you might have another chance in the uh, next session. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the speakers. Thank you. I need to listen again to your uh, uh, presentations. And so from Tunis, I was trying to think as you were speaking. It's something realistic, the solidarity among uh, the uh, the people uh, towards uh, uh, emancipation is something basic. You said the Tunisian people and the Arab uh, who, are, who are in solidarity with us against uh, the oppressor, 
just as they're uh, fighting against the oppressor in Tunisia and against the oppression in Palestine. I have another uh, viewpoint that could uh, solidarity might take us a bit a step uh, forward if we realize that uh, the Zionist uh, project is a regional one. It's not merely a Palestinian project. So it is a threat to the entire region. Also, when I think about the uh, materialistic basis of the uh, Zionist project, for example, the gas uh, uh, agreements with Jordan and Egypt, for example, the agreements uh, made to bar Egypt from using its own uh, resources, including the gas, tremendous uh, amounts of money. This is something, regardless, we want, it's, it's only uh, a strengthening of the hegemony, materialistic uh, hegemony. The support uh, or solidarity with Palestine is also a solidarity, it's a self-solidarity, because whoever expresses the solidarity uh, are facing uh, a stealing of their own uh, resources. So I think solidarity is not merely with the other, with the, with the other but uh, the solidarity amongst us, geographically, regionally, etc. Thank you. Basar Rizqalla. My question is for Abud. He is speaking about uh, friendship, uh, love. We're not talking about the effectiveness of this political project, but this new uh, organization that you're talking about when it has its own structure, the voice is not clear, the sound is not clear, sorry. And during the May uprising, there was a talk about to what extent uh, this event can support the liberation uh, uh, battle, the, the, revolution, the revolution, or the uprising that uh, was uh, across uh, the Palestinian territories. It's clear that this organization is not being able to deal with this uh, uh, security uh, hits or strikes. We have only a minute and a half to listen to Nisaf in Tunis. Only one minute uh, for Abud to uh, complete or to end this session. We're very sorry for this. Nisaf. Okay, I'll take only one minute and give the rest to Abud. I thank uh, uh, Nadia. I, I agree with her uh, that when we, uh, we are uh, in solidarity with the Palestinian people, we are in solidarity with ourselves because we have uh, a common interest and one common cause. That's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Less than a minute. And what I was talking about does not address the, the, the Palestinian groups, whether in Jerusalem or behind the Green Line. I meant the intimacy uh, of the relationship with the, uh, with the colonialists. Uh, uh, system in, in the West Bank, we, su we suffer from the virtual, uh, virtual, uh, any confrontation that involves uh, the West Bank uh, is a demographic liberation. The sound is not clear, sorry. We're talking about 300 martyrs in 
He was back in Jerusalem. It's, it's uh, the action that uh, brings about uh, an exit from all these problems, how people think, how they build their imagination, the things, such obstacles that go into the action. If we don't have obstacles, there is no action. When people are con confronting these uh, obstacles or barriers, this can apply to defense work, uh, the process of clashing with the barriers would produce attempts to find solutions. So it's not merely a question, it's not a question to solve it here in this conference. There are many uh, answers, especially regarding the confrontation and uh, the the inside or the the inside the uh, social structure that we have last question to dr roger about knowledge in the civil society the ability to make a balance between the traditional and the uh, among the intellectuals. I already sent you the question. Uh, the, his voice, we can't hear him well. <laughs> well... <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, traditional versus, of course, I did mention uh, Gramsci. Uh, Gramsci. Um, I think that, that uh, it's a very complicated question, and I don't really see it as, uh, as being uh, kind of the two sides of coin. Uh, I think intellectuals in Palestine uh, are, are torn, are conflicted. Uh, of course, there's the, com as you say, the commodification uh, of knowledge, and that makes us all uh, traditional intellectuals. But there is a burning desire uh, to improve the condition, not only of ourselves, but of the masses of our own countries, and of all other countries uh, that makes us all partially uh, organic intellectuals. So that's a way of not answering your questions, but I really mean uh, what I said <laughs> by way of a non-answer. Non Thank you. So as to go in line with the time, thank you all. We go for a break.
Okay, most welcome. We are. Uh, we know this session uh, is difficult. The fifth session titled Law as a Colonialist Tool. The first day, and this, we hear uh, uh, how the law sometimes is used as a hegemony and subjugation tool. And this session is around the same thing, but with different experiences, experiences related to the internal Palestinian context, international context. We have an experience from Canada. And we have another intervention on the ICC. And the uh, uh, third world uh, experience with new colonialism. And after the presentation, we'll be taking your questions, uh, be it here in the hall or through Zoom. I thought through Zoom maybe, or maybe through the Q&A, or if directly you have any questions, you raise your hand. I can give you the floor to directly make a question. At the start, I would like to uh, uh, introduce my uh, our speakers. We have three papers today. The first one will be with Reem Al Botme, our colleague. She is the director of uh, Law Institute at Birzit University. She is a specialist in legal uh, research and co author of a Palestine book on international law. And the second paper is jointly uh, authored by uh, Reem Bahdi. She's the Dean of Law College at Winston Co uh, College in Canada. And, and she is a co-editor of the Winston Beer Zayt Dignity uh, Initiative. And we have David Kettenberg. Hopefully I'm pronouncing it well. In Netherlands, I hear that they pronounce as Kettenberg. He is a Canadian science professor, he is a journalist, a radio journalist, and a human rights defender, and now he is in the Netherlands. We will be listening in details to the issue that they will be speaking of. Uh, so, the third paper will be with Hala Ashwaibi. She's a member of the International Academy at the Leo College at Birzeit University. And she's the director of the Israeli Studies. Uh, yes, I'm going to uh, a short story. Uh, we had a, an accountant uh, colleague, and he was still behind for the past 10 years. And he said, why? And he said, we've been claiming there was no low welfare. I was fine. So, so actually, there is a low, but it's uh, the way how we handle this, so how the, uh, our, the, our, um, how do our organizations and institutions we are to draw the outlines for um, inquiries and topics that arise about the legal and political institutions that develop in the Palestinian uh, context about the political economy in, uh, in order to understand the structural informations that are related to capitalism and these relations. And these institutions should start by um, uh, uh, to say what is um, what do we mean by investigative? Um, and, and because this is uh, a, an entry, and then we'll try to understand. Uh, we will take uh, examples and different uh, visions about the legal um, system in Palestine. First, we will start the political uh, economy. It is a study of the uh, phenomenon. Uh, when there are inter intersections between the law and um, uh, economics that are related to the real world in uh, law and the political economy through a historical context that is um, of different uh, 
specializations uh, in these three sections and that are uh, different uh, specializations that are separate from each other that are being studied through uh, methods technical and constructive um, practical uh, methods e economy in this regard will not refer to a separate um, ideology it is a methodology that is um, related to a critical uh, approaches that are related to the early, to the low and to economy, it, this could be separated from low and uh, from and uh, poly, politics because of the focus um, on uh, uh, issues of uh, authority and inequality, whether between uh, individuals or groups or sometimes between countries. At this, uh, to be more specific, we focus on how the uh, relations in the authority are formed uh, politically and economically and how they are reformed with time and how this can lead in turn to the um, circumstances of um, uh, development. There are different levels of um, analysis uh, of law uh, and politics. In this intervention, we will address the legal, the specific legal um, uh, concepts related to legislation that has prevailed after the establishment of the PNA. This context for this intervention or this title is uh, uh, forms two problems that we will start to tackle and will argue accordingly. First, um, the attempt in itself and on the level of a state, um, uh, it approves and uh, gives approvals to the uh, status quo. The question is that uh, discussing um, the political um, the economy and the uh, legal frameworks would answer the question of the formations, the um, economic formation, and the, the current um, situation. Let me now um, just mention OSCO as a design um, in order to understand the transformations that happened to the law and law and political economy. Law also was designed as a process in order to make a change, change in the situation of the population uh, uh, who live in the West Bank and Gaza and to transform their situation from um, uh, one uh, state to another. So it, it was a, an attempt to transform the political uh, situation in Palestine uh, from the um, perspective it includes the state of change and, uh, and the state that has um, a legal framework in and in, in order to lead us to the liberation process of the state of Palestine, and, and in order to take into consideration security and funding um, and other things. This required the, the PNA to, to transform itself from the uh, uh, non use of violence to using um, uh, negotiations as part of the solution and to start in uh, addressing the Palestinian and approaching the Palestinian um, the community with, through a uh, System, a legal system that have stemmed from this uh, project, which is establishing a state. It's a national uh, project that will transform the Palestinian state from a, a, a state that is governed by um, foreign laws to a, a project that is governed by local and domestic laws. Therefore, um, new concepts have um, emerged, like the concept of um, uh, citizenship, uh, rule of law, and uh, other concepts, uh, uh, new economic uh, concepts that are related to develop economic development that contributes to transforming the Palestinian community society from undeveloped um, uh, economy based on agriculture to uh, other uh, force form of um, developed economy. Yeah. And, and this is why we need to understand that this project uh, had uh, included an, a tra um, and within it um, a, a transformational um, uh, a status. And the law was one of those tools that would contribute in, in this transformation. It is a tool for, um, uh, therefore, in this uh, instance, uh, the door was opened that the Palestinian law will start to build. Uh, so, and, and took a place uh, to um, to uh, for the conflict within different uh, segments in the in the Palestinian society um, and, and the Palestinian uh, legal system. Accordingly, 
the legal uh, framework uh, took a place to tackle uh, economically and uh, economic and and uh, political uh, status that the, that the state was going um, through. Uh, the PNA uh, is called to improve its preparedness to uh, hold its responsibilities uh, on, a, on the base uh, base of uh, rule of law, and and, and, to, and it has spread um, in, um, in uh, international organizations and um, uh, legal frameworks that were um, sponsored by these foreign um, organizations, and it had become uh, filled with these discourses, and mainly it is that would discuss uh, and, and the elites in, in, in Palestine have given a central role to the law and the uh, legal structures uh, in order to change the political status in Palestine has gone to a better status is an interesting law as a uh, uh, hegemonic uh, um, tool. As what concerns us in this regard, that uh, things change, uh, 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 and the uh, uh, standard where the law has not become only a way of uh, it transforming, but it has become a new cognitive tool, and, uh, and this is what's more, more important um, of uh, when discussing what is why there were laws or there were no laws. The, uh, now it is the framework in which we introduce, uh, we define our problems, and we find solutions to these problems. And if we've noticed that in many cases, um, if we try to uh, inquire what are the problems or what what are the laws that um, um, address um, uh, violence or any other violations? Uh, we can uh, define them. In within the law, and in on the other hand, the wars that we try, to, the the solutions that we try to create, either uh, we can find them through new laws or through through legislating um, new laws or amending uh, uh, the uh, existing laws. So this is the project that is basically uh, uh, built on the new um, idea of having a new state in Palestine. Then we ask our first question, uh, ourselves the question: Can this law create um, a, a new status uh, and a position? Can it uh, create a framework that, that to, re to resist uh, um, this colonial um, occupation? Uh, the first point is that Palestinian laws that were drafted did not uh, form any of these uh, cases, except in uh, some. A minor um, uh, issues. So we start to. There are laws that were drafted within a framework, and and uh, but without meeting the needs, the basic needs of the state. The state uh, need uh, needs, or according to the needs of the state, uh, the, the state needs to, uh, to hold elections. Then a law would be drafted that would. Uh, tackle uh, uh, elections. So this this case does did not form. Um, or this case did not form in itself uh, uh, or lead to a liberation uh, process. Uh, so the main idea is that to, be, uh, to, to build a status or, or, or a national project is, is, uh, is a state by itself. And uh, having a conflict between the old laws and the new laws or, uh, also um, will not lead to any uh, uh, liberating process. Things have changed, and and it, it took a lot. Um, and this, so the, the legal uh, uh, framework, and the, uh, establishing a new legal framework, and uh, and the elites uh, from the beginning, did they uh, consider that this uh, new structure will lead to liberation from the occupation and colonization? Since it is creating a legal authority. And uh, this, up to this moment, did not uh, lead to any change uh, uh, or any uh, uh, type of liberation, and and will not continue uh, directly or indirectly uh, in in creating the status. So the first idea that uh, 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 coming up with a legal framework is a liberating uh, status. I believe this was not the case and will not be the case. And. Uh, or create the uh, ability to confront uh, the occupation without have, uh, having real inquiries, raising real questions about the legal 
Cyprus and uh, Cyprus and new formations in the new um, and and not it, it having a national um, uh, law by itself to to lead to this change. Other concepts that uh, raise questions uh, are between the law and the political economy is uh, the, the new liberal uh, issue. We all know that in the uh, in the new uh, uh, system that calls that to, that markets could uh, regulate themselves by themselves. Uh, th therefore, it's always said that there is a separation between politics and economy because economy does not need. Uh, uh, so I feel that um, uh, there is a need to reconsider uh, uh, this issue, especially when it comes to the Palestinian uh, experience. Uh, the legal Palestinian framework is formed, as in other cases, so the first framework that could uh, create the circumstances, political and legal circumstances, to establish the new liberal economic um, economy. If new liberal uh, as we understand it in the popular way we try to negate the intervention of law then the law in its uh, formation and its relation with the new liberal uh, new liberalism uh, need new laws new regulations and concepts that would be spread and used through this uh, system and we need to understand and the rule of law and even the concepts uh, of the human rights will not prevail in, in the new, within the new liberal um, concepts, except that they were uh, newly formed. This new formation is what, uh, uh, what we need to understand and, uh, and study through uh, this new ideology. And as I mentioned, in, in this uh, context, I would like to mention three uh, basic models for the interventions that we can uh, address basically. First, uh, new institutions were established uh, through this law. As we know, at the beginning, the, the, the law of elections was uh, drafted because of the, uh, uh, the basic law was uh, drafted and, and the, the um, constitution and those and so there were uh, uh, other legal institutions that were formed like the, the plc and the presidency all these structures are not necessarily uh, uh, did not uh, uh, contribute themselves to make a change but they've contributed in uh, creating and forming um, uh, different other institutions so but the basic idea here is that uh, the um, uh, legislative work of uh, the PNA throughout the past year uh, that we did not, I believe, we believe uh, liberating um, uh, status, but have uh, mitigated any social project and uh, the uh, social laws uh, that were to um, uh, enhance, strengthen the resilience of Palestinians and their steadfastness, steadfastness and will mitigate their conflict with the Israel. There were two uh, uh, important laws that uh, uh, emerged during the past uh, period. Some of them uh, were uh, regulated. Uh, it's the labor law that immediately, that all of a sudden it erupted, and it was, uh, many organizations uh, have uh, worked on that law and came with different scenarios, and it was uh, enacted so, um, uh, all of a sudden by um, uh, the late President Abu Ammar, and it uh, was, uh, it served the uh, capitalism or capital um, uh, owners. Uh, so, and if we note here that the uh, social security law that it tried to annul uh, the uh, the allowance uh, of the end of service allowance. So the labor law has emerged since uh, 2000, 2000, 2001, and up till now there is still under discussion and dispute to make be uh, amended to other laws. And and to, um, so this is the only law that was passed. The other law is the um, uh, disability law of the persons with disability of 1999, this law had also carried away a social um, 
uh, approach, but it wasn't implemented. So implementing it on the uh, ground was not uh, done. The uh, social security law that uh, of uh, 2015 uh, is still um, enacted, but it was not Im implemented. Uh, it was passed, but was not implemented. And the last uh, law, there were the law of uh, social security. There were many um, disputes, different disputes, disputes within the Palestinian society. However, the main reading was not um, uh, provided, that the, and the forces who were against this so law it was to, to who would it serve this so is it is it um, uh, there to provide uh, social security to uh, or uh, this system uh, has other economic uh, dimensions that are defined i believe this law did not tackle all this uh, it did not uh, it included neoliberal um, ideas uh, that is um, and that, uh, that does not include the unemployment, doesn't include the uh, security, or, and many of the discussions that uh, should have erupted. So it is, so it, it was an attempt to understand the uh, hidden points and the basics of uh, dealing with this law and what do we need from this law, the social security, the social security as a concept. Uh, uh, we all know that it's, it should be uh, used uh, in the concept that we understand uh, it, uh, from a human rights perspective uh, and a uh, rule of law perspective, but it was made in, 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 in different formations other than what is used and, uh, or written or uh, discussed in different contexts uh, uh, where this law was uh, drafted for. Uh, accordingly, in our uh, addressing the law and 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 the political economy, there's a number of dimensions that uh, these uh, this intervention tried to um, uh, present. But the first logic is the um, uh, cognitive chain. With Oslo, uh, uh, there the came a new uh, cognitive change about the law and the. Uh, role of law and its formation where it became central uh, in its uh, linkage with the state and with politics and it became the cognitive framework through which we were uh, able to uh, achieve our uh, goals um, uh, contrary to this uh, the uh, the the uh, political uh, and legal formations, uh, uh, new formations, did not also serve uh, the national project. Uh, it, it, through its conflict with the uh, occupation, it, 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 and their existence was to create a new class of uh, uh, control for Palestinians uh, that covered Palestinians that did not uh, influence uh, the status quo with the uh, at, uh, civil administrative. Uh, up to now, the Minister of, uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture cannot uh, now tell us what will happen in, in uh, 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 agriculture or farming in uh, the Jordan Valley or other projects. Uh, um, so, uh, so all these projects uh, are uh, they belong to the civil administration. So there is no law. We need to have a law and. and or the pesticides or chemicals, is there a relationship between the uh, law, uh, agricultural law, and the others that are, uh, and the pesticides that are pumped into the Palestinian market uh, that, uh, that um, we get from uh, uh, Israel? So it's clear that we, we, uh, ha we are uh, working within two uh, separate laws that are not linked to it legal frameworks that are not linked to each other and do, uh, and that they work uh, they never intersect so our in our follow up to this uh, formation and this uh, legal framework we see that it has contributed basically to uh, the new liberal uh, structures in Palestine and focusing on um, uh, new liberal uh, colonizing uh, authorities which serve the, the politics uh, and the policies of of these new liberal uh, structures whether directly uh, under uh, the uh, new structures and uh, phenomena, which is uh, security and and to have a strong we need to have a strong penal law, and and this is the basic model for the law and economy in all this equation that is uh, followed globally and internationally.
we're still talking within the same requirements uh, made by the ongoing or the current colonial uh, uh, presence and how they've been dealing with this. Uh, we move to the next paper, uh, Colonialism Incarnated in a Bottle of Wine, uh, the Kattenberg case, Srim Mahdi and Nebit Kattenberg. I don't know how you divided your paper. Yes, hello. I think I think I'm going first. <laughs> uh, greetings, everybody. Greetings from uh, uh, Breda in the Netherlands. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Um, uh, greetings to <clears throat> Muatin. Thanks for organizing this <clears throat> the, the, this session. And greetings to, to uh, friends and colleagues at Beard State University. I visited Beard State a couple of times, and uh, Beard State is in my heart. Um, my name is David Kattenberg. I'm a, a dual U.S. Canadian citizen, born in the United States, moved to Canada when I was 18 to avoid the Vietnam War. Um, my par I am Jewish. My, my parents were both Jewish, and their parents were Jewish. And uh, both my parents survived the Holocaust. My, my father's family, Dutch family, was decimated. Some hundred or more Kattenbergs perished in Sobibor and Auschwitz, including my grandmother. Uh, I am a friend of the Palestinian people. My, my background is in science and biology, um, but I've been doing for journalism for years and years. And... Um, somehow at some point became very, uh, very uh, compelled to support the Palestinian cause. When I was younger, I, I must confess, without having thought it out, I was a bit of a Zionist. I kind of believed the, the mythology, uh, but I'm uh, no longer. At some point, I changed. Uh, and it's don't, don't ask me why or how. Uh, it might have been as the result of living in, 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 in late revolutionary Nicaragua, uh, helping helping the Sandinistas out in the movement as a, an internationalist. Um, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, I've since 2007, well, I first visited Jerusalem, Israel and Jerusalem in 1984. That was an amazing experience, recollecting it. I won't go on about that. That was before my consciousness had changed. I visited uh, Palestine in 2007, and then again in 2012, and 13, and 16, and 17, and 19, um, traveling up and down um, occupied Palestine and the West Bank, um, making lots of friends, uh, whom I all love. And um, last time was in 2019, and I've witnessed Israeli apartheid up close and personal, uh, up close and personal. Uh, I've seen it in action. Um, uh, cutting a little bit to the chase here, just this is all background. In, in January of 2017, uh, having gotten a bee in my bonnet because I, I enjoy drinking wine, um, I decided to go look up uh, who what settlement wines that were being sold on Canadian store shelves and I immediately went to the, the website of the largest liquor, liquor retailer in the world, I believe, is the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, the LCBO, and discovered that on their website they were selling two wines, obviously settlement wines, one from Shiloh Settlement, uh, processed, bottled and processed, I believe, in Maale Livona, right in the heart of the Northern West Bank, and uh, at Sagot. Uh, Sagot Winery, just, just on the edge of uh, Albire, Ramallah. And, I, I, I and they were labeled product of Israel. They were labeled product of Israel. So I was outraged. And the reason, uh, more than anything else, was because what this constituted, of course, was a sovereignty claim, Israel's sovereignty claim over the settlements, you know, brazen and flagrant. These are products of Israel. Uh, on Canadian store shelves. So the Liquor Control Board of Ontario and the government of Canada truly 
were endorsing Israel's def- endorsing Israel's claim um, to sovereignty um, and, and to Israel's effective de facto annexation. I mean, this went through my mind I, in total contravention of international law and laws that Canada is bound to abide by, including its own domestic laws like the Geneva Conventions Act of Canada. So I complained. Um, it's a long and complicated story. The, 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 it soon landed on the desk of the, of the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which regulates labeling. And they took six months to analyze my complaint. And they did so from every last direction possible. They, they left no stone unturned. And they were exhaustive examining their own domestic statutes, the Food and Drug Act and the Consumer Packaging and Labeling Act, but also consulted with Global Affairs Canada. And Global Affairs Canada, of course, I'm going to share it my screen here, Global Affairs Canada uh, informed the Canadian Food Inspection Agency that, yes, indeed, this is formal Canadian policy. Right there it is on issues on Israel and Palestine. I'm not going to read this. You can read it yourselves. Occupied territories and settlements. Canada does not recognize permanent Israeli control over, over the Golan, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Fourth Geneva Convention. Israel is obliged to uphold the Fourth Geneva Convention. Um, it refers to UN Security Council Resolutions 446 and 465 that declared settlements flagrantly illegal, on and on and on and on and on. So Global Affairs Canada confirmed this to the CFIA, saying, yeah, we, we don't consider settlements to be part of Israel. But they did more than that. They dug down into the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement. Uh, the people in trade branch at Global Affairs Canada dug into the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement, SIFTA. And I, 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 I mean, this, I, one can go into the weeds, but they very quickly established, and I have the evidence to show this, that A, labeling, product labeling is not a SIFTA purpose. It, nowhere in SIFTA does it talk anywhere about product labeling. Uh, and, and secondly, a more, almost more to the point of this talk, which Reem will talk about, Reem is going to talk about in greater detail. I'm sure the trade branch and GAC people established that the, the territorial definition of Israel under SIFTA is defined by the Paris Protocol, by the economic protocol between Israel and the Palestinians of 1995, embedded in the interim agreement, which says nothing about settlements, except in one place in terms of a tax collection, but nothing about customs arrangements, nothing, squat, nada. So they told the CFIA this, and they said back in April, May 2017, and they told the CFIA, forget about SIFTA, just follow your own labeling guidelines. That's all, forget about SIFTA. And so that's what the CFIA did. In early July of 2017, they issued a ruling to the Liquor Control Board of Ontario saying, product of Israel labels on settlement wines do not comply with Canadian law. Deal with this. Send us your plan for dealing with this. Um, they didn't tell them, take the wines off your shelves. They just said, this is a problem and an issue. Labels don't comply. Let's deal with this. That was the ruling within oh, hours, hours, uh, the Israeli government was on the horn complaining up and down and all up and through Global Affairs Canada, and I'm sure right up to the prime minister's office. And the, 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 the Canadian lobby, the Zionist lobby went snake eyes, as we say in English, forgive my, my colloquial, they got very upset. And within... 48 hours, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency reversed itself. In fact, it reversed itself in a matter of a business day um, and ruled the product of Israel labels are okay based on one reason. SIFTA allows it. Now, this was the most preposterous and outrageous act 
which I'm not going to go into because SIFTA, I've, I've laid it out to you, like Global Affairs Canada people had told CFI, SIFTA's got nothing to do with it, and they had even examined the Paris Protocol, right? They knew, but the government, the government uh, reverse engineered it in a highly cynical way by saying, the higher upper, it went right up to the prime minister's office, my friends. It went right up to the Privy Council office and the prime minister's office. So you, you need to know this, that this is the, uh, Justin Trudeau's position on Israel and Palestine. Uh, they, they instructed the CFIA to say, yeah, just talk about West Bank. Israeli customs laws are applied in the West Bank. Settlements are in the West Bank. A ergo, you're good to go. N knowing that it was a, a fraudulent reading of SIFTA. I'll let Reem go on about this, but we appealed, I appealed, and my good friend and comrade lawyer, Canadian Montreal-based lawyer, Dimitri Lascaris, filed a, a, an appeal to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. They rejected my appeal. So we filed a notice of application to the Federal Court of Canada, which in, at the end of July 2019, the Federal Court of Canada ruled that product of Israel labels on settlement lines are, quote, false, misleading, and deceptive, end quote. And here was the, the exciting part, and an infringement of the Canadian Charter guaranteed right of Canadian consumers to truthful information on labels so that they can make conscientious consumer decisions based on matters that are not limited to health and safety. They could be ethical, political, social, cultural, anti-imperialist. Um, and it's, it's protected by the charter. So the Canadian government appealed the federal court ruling. As I say, going to the wall, this is a, an expression from baseball where the, the batter hits a ball way out in the left field and the runner goes running out and he jumps up. And he catches, he goes right to the wall and he catches the ball, right? That's what we mean by going to the wall. So the Canadian government went to the wall to defend Israel's right to, to effectively claim sovereignty over settlements on Canadian store shelves and conceal their crime from Canadian consumers. Uh, uh, totally transgressing, quashing Canadian domestic laws and international laws that Canada is supposed to abide by, right? So this is Canada appealing a ruling, right? In May, the Federal Court of Appeal dismissed the government's appeal, but sent the issue back to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency because courts are not supposed to decide solutions for bad management decisions. Federal regulators have to figure it out. This time they have to explain the reasoning for labeling based on Canadian domestic statutes. And they can rely on SIFTA if they wish, but they need to, they can't make SIFTA determinative. Well, that redetermination, which I say, <laughs> SIFTA actually has less to do with labeling than zero, right? So this is going for reconsideration at the CFIA in this late fall and winter. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency will either uphold its decision that product of Israel labels are okay, or it may reinstate its, its initial decision, which I think would be astonishing given Canada's stalwart, stalwart support for Israel, steadfast support for Israel's settlement enterprise and, and, uh, and support for Israel's right to do anything it wishes or not to do anything it wishes with impunity, no questions asked, and Canada will help. So if the CFIA goes back to its the decision that the labels don't conform, uh, that'll be astonishing. Uh, in closing, um, I am not the only person making presentations to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Sagot Winery is also a party. Sagot Winery is a party, which is the first time ever that I know of in Canadian law and Canadian federal regulatory processes that a foreign entity engaged in a presumptive war crime gets to make a deposition, present their arguments to a federal regulator. Never has that happened before. Um, the other deposition and I'll finish here. Uh, affidavit is from 
uh, a good friend of ours, Munif Tresh from Ramallah. He and a group of landowners in in in, uh, in Albire, whose land has been taken by Sagot Winery, including uh, Munif's brother, without any compensation. Obviously, the land is stolen. Sagot Winery is sitting on stolen land, and there's an affidavit before the, the federal courts in Canada confirming, naming the landowners from whom the land was stolen. So this is going to be considered by, we hope, by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And if they make the wrong decision at the end of this year, we're going to do it all over again. We're going to go right back to court and eventually maybe it will get to the Supreme Court. So I, I send all of you folks my love and, and admiration and uh, sorry for going on so long. I'll leave it, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Reem. That was exceptionally complicated. Uh, thank you from uh, Windsor in Canada, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, Palestine. We miss you all very much and hope that uh, we can be together in person at some point soon. So, as David said, I was part of a team of lawyers and legal academics who sought to make arguments in his case. And I should point out that I'm here in my capacity as a professor and a legal academic and not as Dean of Windsor Law. And what I wanted to just very quickly, uh, without going into too much details, is just talk about um, some of the arguments that the Canadian government made before the federal court uh, in David's case. And I want to do that to show um, how the strained interpretation, the really difficult to understand and accept from, from my humble opinion, interpretation of agreements reached between Israelis and Palestinians has been used um, as a form of, of hegemony, a tool of hegemony, um, and how these things, hegemony steeps down into even the smallest of details to serve larger colonial lands. So the, the arguments that are made in the court are presented by the Attorney General of Canada, and the Attorney General's argument boils down, as David has suggested, to the idea that Israel's territory includes territory where its custom laws apply. And it looked to several different sources to make that argument, but one of the main sources was, uh, again, as David has suggested, what's called either the Paris Protocol or the Protocol on Economic Relations which is an agreement between the PLO and Israel. And the argument is that the PLO had actually agreed that custom laws apply to the West Bank, Israel's custom laws apply to the West Bank. And the Attorney General went so far as to suggest that this was a tantamount or the same as agreeing that Israeli settlements would be considered Israeli territory or equated uh, with Israel with the consent of, of um, Palestinian uh, authorities. So this is a really puzzling argument uh, for a number of different reasons. I don't need to tell all of you this. Uh, one reason why it's puzzling is that if you read the Protocol on Economic Relations, as David said, settlements are only mentioned once, and it says uh, all it says is that taxes are collected from Palestinian laborers um, that would be transferred to the Palestinian Authority. And it, significantly, settlements are mentioned as entities that are separate from the state of Israel. And this isn't surprising, of course, because... If we cast our mind back to um, the Oslo framework, both sides had agreed that borders and settlements would be resolved during um, right future negotiations. So that argument didn't make a whole lot of sense in court. But you know, you can you can ask, well, maybe there was something in the purpose of the economic protocol that might suggest that there was um, something to the Canadian argument position. 
But if you look at the purpose of the economic protocol, which was very clearly laid out, uh, the purpose was to lay, quote, I'm using a quote here, lay the groundwork for the strengthening of the economic base of the Palestinian side. And of course, we all know that settlements do the exact opposite. They thwart uh, the economy, among other things, um, on the quote-unquote Palestinian side. And we also know, of course, that Palestinians have repeatedly objected uh, to the existence of settlements, and the international community has recognized that they're illegal. And this illegality alongside the prohibition on the acquisition of the use of, of uh, force to gain territory, the right to self-determination, the requirement to read international treaties according to their plain meaning and object and purpose. And so are, these are among other principles that really defy the Canadian government's arguments in court are all well known. They're better known to you than they are to me. And I won't go into them. But the Canadian government simply ignored all of these things in its arguments before the federal court. It didn't engage any of these principles, but relied instead on a skewed reading of the Paris Protocol and stripped it of its normative context that would have been provided by international law. And um, the Canadian government's position in David's case is all the more troubling because its insistence that beer and wine grown and bottled in the West Bank by Palestinians cannot be sold in Canada under the product of Palestine label. Instead, when you see that product in Canada, what happens is the Canadian government takes a sticker, and I think it's the government that does this, the Canadian authorities, they take a sticker about this big and they take the time to put it on every single bottle of wine and every single bottle of beer that's uh, sold on the shelves or ordered by consumers. So at the end of the day, as, as David has suggested, it was seen that the Canadian government has chosen to support Israel's claim over territory on which the illegal settlement, settlements sit at the expense of many things, international law, uh, normative principles, and among the things that um, has been dispensed are the uh, interests of Canadian consumers to purchase according to their conscience and in light of international law and policy. Um, so as David's noted, and I won't go on too much here um, because I, I see the time, the Canadian government didn't win before the federal court, but I think he's also explained that his case remains in a difficult position and David I'm not sure if you want to speak to that. And if you do, let me just say this, that um, many of us who have been involved in David's case, and I suspect maybe David himself, have often asked ourselves the question, why are we spending so much time, so much energy, so many resources in a case when we go to court hoping to get justice, what we end up talking about are a series of documents that are grounded in the Oslo framework, which is a framework that is irrelevant at best and harmful, harmful um, at worst, and harmful for many reasons, among them that it continues this fiction of negotiations. Why shouldn't we just ignore this case about labeling wines and put our energy and resources elsewhere? And I mean, these are good questions, of course, and, and I and others struggle with them. I'll leave you with just two thoughts. The first is, as I think Reem Butme suggested in the opening of her remarks, the law comes to you sometimes. And if we ignore the hegemony as it manifests in seemingly small things like product labels, the hegemonic arguments advanced would have no counter arguments. 
And as we know, uh, counter narratives are important because they form the basis of liberation politics ultimately. So it's not always necessarily about the legal arguments that are being made or who wins or loses. Of course, you know, when uh, someone like David brings a case in the hope of winning, but we can't lose sight that it's the counter narratives and the opportunity to present counter narratives that are important. And then second, I think these kinds of cases form the basis of solidarities that extend well beyond the case itself. I wouldn't have had the pleasure of of meeting and the privilege of meeting David until we started working on these cases together. And these solidarities in turn can help create or reinforce social movements. And it's really, I think, through social movements that one generates and that groups and communities and causes generate change through public mobilization and political action. And oftentimes these things are juxtaposed against legal action or legal courses. But what I want to suggest is that they can actually reinforce each other. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you're all well. في القضية حسيت حالي بقرأ رواية لكافكا يعني دخلت في إجراءات وفي and you feel this way so speaking of the law as being used as a tool this shows several things like uh, in area C that is under occupation while in reality uh, or in the international uh, community the world is not getting it and while in the ground it's totally different maybe later on we can discuss I think we are already behind time for discussion now we next intervention for Hala Ashaibi on the ICC and the vision of the Third World on the new liberal uh, building. Oh. For being here, and I know how difficult it is to be the last speaker. So I promise you, my paper is going to be summarized as much as possible. In the year 2002, the ICC was established, and we got the Rome Statute that stated on the establishment of the ICC, which got into force, and the court started functioning. This statute came as a result of different discussions and negotiations. And the countries finally agreed on a freezing that we called it the Rome Statute. Along with the Rome Statute, there was a great hope in its uh, criminal law, so much that many countries and even some activists considered the court as a gateway for their uh, liberation projects, including in Palestine. Even the Palestinian uh, discourse, official discourse here, pinned high hopes on the ICC as if it is the one that's going to be to liberate Palestine. And even non-official Palestinian discourse, different activists and organizations, they pinned high hopes on the uh, ICC. But if we look at the situation in the last few years, we started hearing criticism against this court. Part of this criticism is that this court is only holding Africans accountable as if it is there for the Africans. And some are asking, why is it happening? Are Africans alone committing crimes? No, Europeans, they do the same. But people look at a certain bias against Africans, so maybe there is a bias against Africans or certain structure. I assume that this focus on African countries is a result of the structure of Rome Statute itself that established the courts. So it is not a result 
of uh, historical bias by influentials within the court or maybe or because of Africans committing crimes. I believe the problem, uh, problematic aspects of this bias against Africans is a structural one within the Rome Statute. To understand that, we need to look into the statute and the history of its writing and its texts. <clears throat> so I'll discuss two subjects. First, the role of the Security Council. What is the role of the Security Council with the ICC? Number two, what types of crimes that are stated in the statute? And this makes us better understand why the court has come to this position. First, the relation of the Security Council with the ICC. The relation of the uh, uh, Council with the ICC has two bases. First, Article 13 says that the Security Council can refer the situation in a given country to the court. This is important. If we refer back to the negotiations that preceded this article, there was a lot of the, many differences. But can a politicized entity, can it refer the situation in a given country to a judicial uh, uh, actor? No, many people were saying any intervention by the Security Council is political by nature. Nonetheless, uh, some influential countries, they wanted to have a clear role for the Security Council. At the start, this proposed role was much more than what we see now. Now, how it's stated, it says the Security Council can refer uh, a case in a certain country to the court, provided we have a resolution based on Chapter 7. And so what is happening is reproducing the same old colonial international regime, which we call it the Rome Statute for the ICC. Practically, there's something important here, is that it implements the, the statute on countries that are not accepting its jurisdiction. <laughs> and if we look at it in, on the history of this article, we notice that some countries tried to give this right to the General Assembly considering that the General Assembly is the entity that includes all country where they can evade the full control of the Security Council. But this was totally rejected, mainly by the uh, superpowers uh, US, China, um, France, and others. So where do we stand now? The situation in a given country can be referred by uh, the Security Council. So this is a political decision where the court has to deal with it. Okay, maybe the court might say there is no case, but the court has to handle such a situation. By the way, there were two cases, like in Sudan and Libya. I have a comment on how the uh, loopholes in the Rome Statute are used. The legal argument, part of the legal, uh, legal argument why to give this power to the Security Council is that the Security Council has the right to establish criminal courts based on events in different countries. Like there's a special tribunal on Rwanda and Yugoslavia. So instead of the Security Council establishing all these courts, we allow to refer the case directly to the ICC. But if you look at the details uh, to see the resolution 1253, which is on Sudan, Article 7 says that any expenditure of spending on accountability or any investigation on Sudan, same thing in Libya, is not uh, carried by the UN or Security Council, but rather the ICC. So we see how countries like the US who are against the Charter, the, the statute and the court, but how they use it. They want to hold Omar al-Bashir accountable, but instead of establishing a court that costs them money, they refer it to the court to handle this case. And the same thing happened in Libya. So here we see how the legal, the international legal structure is being used or abused with these loopholes there. I have a final comment that 
the U- uh, United States issued a directive saying anything that has to do with funds related to the countries held accountable will not be reversible and the UN will not uh, take any expenses in this regard. Also, there is an important role for the Security Council that we need to notice is that the Security Council can differ or delay any investigation in the ICC. So now the Palestinian case is uh, uh, looked at by the ICC. But now the Security Council on 16 can delay looking into the case uh, by the ICC based on decision by the Security Council. So this is another intervention by uh, the Security Council. If we go to the history of these negotiations, the Security Council wanted to expand these powers more. The Security Council wanted to put uh, any case of any country automatically on its, uh, to prevent the ICC from looking into any case that is being discussed by the Security Council. So if we don't want the court to look into the Syrian case, so we put it on our agenda on the Security Council, but after uh, some pressure by some countries, there was that compromise that in order to prevent or stop the work of the ICC, we need to submit an official request that does not await consent for the court. But the Security Council would request the ICC at any, case, uh, any stage of the case, investigation, accountability, whatever, and the court will stop all its activities on that, case, on that case. So, again, we see how the uh, work of the court is politicized and how the Security Council decides, like in the Palestinian case, for instance, now there are negotiations, and so we, we, we need the court to uh, stop or cease looking into that. So, how this is used, especially like in the US, it was behind all this use, that they issued two resolutions, 2003 and, and 2000, like to, uh, in the, they will not uh, go, like not only they delay accountability, but they used it to prevent accountability for any member of peacekeeping forces in any country that is subject to investigation by the court. So these are just two short points to see where are the loopholes in Rome statute. One last third point. What are the types of crimes in the statute? If you look at the statute, it's important to be critical when we look at it, especially when we speak of the international law like the trail or the compact. He looked at the international law, which should be uh, neutral. It is looked at in light of its long relation with the uh, uh, occupation. We, he says we need to look at these legal rules from a different perspective, from the historical perspective, and looking at the Rome statute, we need to look critically at it, like how it is connected with the new colonialism and how this colonialism affected its structure and in selecting the crimes there. For instance, if we look at the statute, first, it does not hold accountable for any crimes that happened before 2002 or whenever it is in place. Why this is important? Yes, it's important for forming the court, and without that, we didn't have had a court, but it's important that all the forced migration and all the uh, crimes committed by the Europeans are outside the jurisdiction this way. And if we look at the crimes, they took a major part of the crimes in Geneva conventions without amending them. For instance, the statute prohibits forced uh, uh, migration, uh, displacement, sorry. And but if we look at the text, it says forced displacement 
is prohibited in case of occupation. So if a state, a given state, uh, displaces an, another nation not under occupation, then this is allowed. Another thing, any crimes related to abusing human resources, which are mostly used by European colonialist forces, this is not there in the statute. Also, the collective punishment. Collective punishment is internationally criminalized. But in Rome statute, collective punishment is not there. One last one also. Example, which has to do with economic uh, crimes. Since economic crises are only commit, mostly committed by the superpowers or major countries, so economic crimes are not there. Be it uh, money laundering or any forms of economic crimes or even so, uh, or in high seas, these are not mentioned there in the statute. So this shows how the statute did not take into consideration the other countries in the world and how the international law developed and stopped here. How the criminal law was before so many years because the early days of the international criminal law was on the accountability for those defeated in the war. And this way we continue this. There are some good things uh, to mention some of them. The statute states on criminalizing settlement. This is important because uh, set, uh, uh, settlement is part of colonialism. And this is an important thing, but it did not go any further. One last thing, when you speak, shall we not deal with the court? No. I believe there is a need for two things. First, not to pin high hopes on the court as uh, a track or a path for liberation. And secondly, the need to change the court. How? Partially the uh, uh, articles we, uh, we write and there are several papers by the uh, uh, civil society submitted to the court. But it is not enough to say, okay, here's a crime. There is a need for a greater role in amending and developing the international criminal law. Thank you. As I understood, the court still represents the uh, victorious. And in the Palestinian case, Maybe there is no need for the third party because we have experiences in the history, such as the advisory role of the ICJ, where it stopped, or the Goldstone Report 2008-2009, it was taken off the table. Sometimes there are political pressures that affect the legal area, legal rights. Okay, we don't have much time. But we'll try to open the floor for some discussion or questions from the hall. We can take a few questions from the hall, then we can go from take from Zoom. Who has the mic, please? Those who would like to ask, please introduce yourself and to whom uh, uh, you are asking. And if you have intervention, Please make it not more than two minutes. Good evening, Brian. I'm Abu Shammas. I'm a lecturer at the uh, accounting department at the university. I have two points. The first thing, the legislative action, as mentioned by Dr. Reem. My question, if the Legislative Council, is it, if it is active and playing its role, wouldn't the situation be better? In 2007, in the West Bank, for instance, since that time, the laws are being issued with presidential decrees. We have seen a large number of these decrees issued this way. Some of them uh, were an accelerated way and did not take 
uh, enough, we are not subject to enough uh, discussions with civil society. So if the Legislative Council is active, will the situation be better? And the next point has to do with who writes the laws, drafts them, uh, I mean, uh, if there are uh, economic interests, many lo laws such as income uh, tax and others. So maybe these are not the laws that we uh, aspire for to serve the marginalized. Uh, so there is a great impact for these laws and uh, they are, these laws are being influenced by uh, the rich. So laws sometimes even further complicate the situation. And we uh, don't see the balance that we should be looking at it. Because the law sides with the rich thinking. Hello. Arud Mraktan, a student of democracy and human rights. I need to compliment on the same point, previous points on the law. Question is to. Dr. Reem, you said the law, like on social insurance, and uh, in its new liberal uh, format. How can the law be a new liberal in the very first place? How could it be in a situation like our situation, which is new liberal? How can it be otherwise? Not this way. Although social insurance faced resistance by two groups, a group that says we need amendments, certain amendments and certain articles, and another group that was very clear saying we want to bring down and abolish all that law. And at the end, the law was frozen. And these were the major companies, capitalist companies, the new liberal ones. How can the law be not new liberal addressing issues in new liberal uh, context? So I see some uh, contradiction here. So as if you are asking for a revolutionary law, but revolutionary uh, revolt against what? <laughs> How can, how would the law look like in order to be a, a revolutionary or liberating one? Somehow I see it uh, complicated. Sahar? Sahar Al-Jalad. Question is, Dr. Uh, 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 who, who spoke about the ICC? And as said, there are several things that are excluded. Is there any horizon for solutions? Is there any international pressure by legal activists and human rights defenders to change this situation? Yes, it is against the South, against the occupied, against natural resources. Europe is occupying African countries and destroying land there. But they face uh, no uh, sanctions or punishments. So is there any international activism pushing for more for justice and equality. Thank you. Thank you. Monia Bahar, a student at the university. My question to 
HALA on the ICC. It's known here since 2014, Palestine accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC. My question, was it okay to uh, make it after uh, 2014 or since 2007 or before that? That's number one. And number two, can the Human Rights Council play a role in pressuring the court for in serving the Palestinian cause? Thank you. Can we take answers? Thanks for the questions, because they complement things that we did not mention. At the start, if there was any difference that the Legislative Council can make, yes, it can. But allow me to clarify one important thing in the equation that I'm mentioning here. If the knowledge uh, uh, is changed, then having a Legislative Council, not having it, then it will not differ. Uh, maybe someone will uh, uh, object or not, but... So the whole issue is based on the idea of checking any uh, revolutionary uh, capabilities. So this law came to change the revolutionary law and onto other regular legal thing. So there are different equations that take us out of this state of affairs or knowledge. And that's why partially there was a legislative council and there were attempts to uh, uh, build these uh, institutions of the state. Some they believe it can constitute a state, a legal state, but in my view, this is not enough This is not enough to add an article here and there to say we have a revolutionary state. No, the revolutionary state requires departing this, these many concepts that are there. We, as legal people, also we are brought up on them. This is the first thing. Also, yes, there are different interests that are being served. There are laws and practices also. The laws serve the interests of certain groups, and we can study this at different ways, like in taxes and others. Even the most where there is, where we find such uh, a case in international law uh, and similarities with Israeli laws is the uh, money laundering laws and the monetary authority, uh, its directive. So, this, so these are connected with this. Before two to three years, there was an Israeli law related to cash and started to be implemented in uh, the, uh, the formal directives here. So, on the contrary, we are not in conflict, but rather we are in harmony with the, many of these. And the impact uh, of the people, people they need uh, started uh, taking their money out of the banks. So this is reforming the Palestinians financially. What should be hidden, what should be done in this area, which is an area of research. Yes, it is not here in the study, but there are several questions that have to do with the situation. As for the next question, I think you are asking me if we can, if there is a possibility for a revolutionary situation, isn't it? What, what is the law? What type of the law? And 
the form of this law, this new liberal law. I'm speaking about the social insurance law. I said there was no reading for the law. There was a opposition and consent, but there was no analysis to this law as a, a tool or one of the laws compared to other Palestinian legislations. There are uh, uh, suggestions uh, that can be used. So it had um, a broader uh, framework to deal with the social cases in a different uh, way than that uh, in the social security law. So I believe uh, if it's if it's not whether it's uh, presented or not, uh, we need to see what are the interests that were harmed. There was, uh, for example, the laborers' uh, interests were harmed uh, uh, largely. The results of the uh, social security is uh, way uh, dangerous or more serious than accepting it or uh, refusing it. All these changes, this appears in the banks, in the new contracts of the banks, even here in the university, in the various types, and whether contractual, the new uh, work uh, relationships, and many uh, similar issues. So the and social security used to look uh, uh, something glamorous or very attractive to certain people, but I think uh, even Martin did uh, uh, many searches and studies about uh, the social security. There are attempts to reduce this concept uh, uh, of the social security based on uh, uh, um, engagement or maybe subscriptions uh, related to so many things including the unemployment or uh, other cases similar to those in the world regarding the social security i hope i answered your question quickly or uh, is there any action or lobbying for change There are different groups who see the international law as an oppressive uh, tool, but uh, the majority of these groups are outside the mainstream. They're not in the mainstream. This is something basic. If, and even worse than that, uh, the international law that is being uh, uh, taught in universities within, within the system that produces uh, similar concepts, what is the international uh, uh, law based on uh, in the light in the, in the light of the uh, or under the uh, colonialism? So even when they look at how to amend the, the, the international criminal law, it would be uh, nothing more than a statement here or a sentence there, but not an amendment based on a structural uh, uh, base or background. Uh, they are very limited. Is there a role of the Human Rights Council? No. Uh, part of the work of the International Criminal Court uh, is an emphasis by the ICJ that we have nothing to do with human rights, as if there's a gap uh, between uh, both parties. Uh, but uh, the truth uh, is that there is um, uh, much uh, more closeness than the way they look at it. Regarding the jurisdiction of the court, there had been an attempt in 2009 uh, that uh, the court uh, has, that this court has a jurisdiction regarding the Palestinians uh, uh, but uh, this uh, brought uh, about uh, a very big uh, uh, political uh, uh, problem, uh, a question mark, is Palestine a state or not? And who has the right to, to look into certain cases before that court? It's only for states. And this led us to reconsider or to go back to 2011 or 2012, and we had to look for the word or the uh, state. 
So uh, they would they would only go back to 2011. Why did we use uh, uh, 2014? Because it was one day before the Gaza war, the war in Gaza. There's a concern by the Palestinian party. If we go back to uh, dates uh, in the past, this would uh, lead to many crimes uh, uh, caused by the Palestinian uh, side. Just to emphasize this, the resolution or decision was a political one rather than anything else. Ahud has another question. Or anybody else? My question is for Mr. David. I don't know if he still hears us or not. I am. I'm here. The Zionists and your, your parents or grandparents, they were in Auschwitz. Um, so what was your turning point to, to become, to become pro-Palestinian, coming like from Zionist and then, and then to, to become like this uh, inspiring pro-Palestinian Canadian Jewish man? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. This is the question that I said I wouldn't be able to answer. I'm getting I'm getting feedback here through my own. I think I know I know why. No, no, I'm not getting feedback anymore. Yeah, this is this is the eternal question. I mean, in, uh, my my family, my father and mother were both, and their families, Jewish families, were as best as I know, non-traditional, non-religious, and non-traditional, non-practicing. Uh, you know, Jewish people, they knew they were Jewish, of course, but they just weren't traditional or practicing. It was the same in my family. I'm not religious. I'm not, I don't practice, uh, so on and so on. Uh, you know, I'm a fully, uh, a fully out there. Um, back at, but back in 1984, uh, I don't know, I just wasn't very politically mature. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to describe. It wasn't so much that I was a Zionist. It's just that in retrospect, um, I, I, I recall that I had all these ideas, like Israel is defending itself in the cradle against all these Arab countries trying to invade it, and you know, so on and so forth. And you know, I thought that you know, Entebbe was incredibly heroic, and, and so on and so on. I didn't have any analysis at all, and I went to I went to, um, I went to uh, to Jerusalem, and I remember getting kind of uh, buttonholed or picked up by an Orthodox man, Jewish man, who took me to Mea Sharim to have Shabbat dinner. It was all very strange, and I felt very distant from it all. I didn't connect. It, I just didn't connect. And I remember, I remember very well being in East Jerusalem on a tour that I had been taken on by some, I mean, I didn't understand this back then, but it was a right-wing Jewish organization. They took us to the Arab the Palestinian quarter of Jerusalem, old city, saying, going on, shouting about how Hitler Hitler didn't succeed in, in, in killing us, but you're you're just by, you know, marrying some woman who's not Jewish, you're this is our, you know, so I all that. I didn't have any analysis at all. Um but then in uh, you know, in the late nineteen eighties I went to Nicaragua as an internationalist with a group called Science, Science for the People. And uh, for three years, I was a pro-Sandinista internationalist helping the revolution. And that gave me an, a little bit of an analysis. I mean, it filtered in, right? I heard about the Sandinistas going on about Zionism and 
uh, you know, their connection to Cuba and Russia and socialism and so on and so on and so on. I think it was around then, but I, I can't explain to you. I, you know, after then, I just became very much a Palestinian advocate. That's all I have to say. Thank you. And I think it's difficult uh, to answer, but if the law was presented in some of the interventions and that, uh, it, uh, that the law and the statute had that uh, would lead to uh, hegemony, to uh, monopolization, we, what do we do as, as institute, as Muatan Institute, as uh, law um, institute? And so we inter in internally, we're activists. And when we talk about this, the justice sector, we, we consider ourselves as part of this uh, sector. So uh, are we here to do a reform? Uh, what is our role? Uh, when yesterday we discussed uh, the reform concept, or is it a revolutionary role? What, what do we mean by revolutionary? Or is it uh, uh, to uh, restruct, uh, reconstruct a new world, a different world? I, I, I don't have answers. I don't know, uh, really. These are difficult questions. But but I believe we need, really, to think of uh, to these questions, to consider, the, just as uh, Reem and Hala mentioned, this uh, uh, issue, which uh, has lots of interventions uh, through the elites, internationally or regionally, how will we present such cases to the coming generation? How can we explain them? Can we ex interpret the other context? Uh, do we just uh, present them as the abstract context or try to think together about the, our uh, interpretation to such contexts. I don't know what you, um, if you have uh, other ideas. However, um, I think we're uh, running out of time and now we're, we should start with the final observations and comments. So Modar is uh, waiting for us. We have the last three minutes. The topic is, is really difficult to uh, to tackle. We are talking about uh, official and formal institutions, and our role is, as in the in the previous session, there was a criticism about our role as as an institute. So, uh, uh, yes, I would like to say some uh, final comments. And be, be, due to my previous work in um, land management, and when we reviewed the statutes on land, and when the World Bank or anyone uh, to prove any uh, uh, a review. I was one time a project director and I told them there should be a, a local counterpart. And, and we've uh, nominated the uh, Birzeit University then uh, at the Faculty of Law to do the review. Uh, to, and, and without uh, that review, and we've done this in the proper way, uh, and we've done, um, in a, uh, we've, did this, uh, we've done this review in a participatory manner. We've reviewed all uh, with all the stakeholders, uh, uh, whether in um, uh, governmental institutions and in academia. And that's why the new laws uh, that were uh, drafted for the uh, properties were not implemented. And uh, those in power uh, it did not uh, contribute to enacting them because uh, they started to customize them according to their needs. So it took us two years to pressure and lobby to make a change. And this uh, uh, reiterates what uh, Dr. Reem had uh, uh, just mentioned, the, even uh, under the uh, PLC, and uh, even with the first reading and the second reading, uh, since the PLC's members are not legal people or they're not fully qualified to review these uh, statutes. Yes, I remember this, and I remember how the law was halted and and they have said but there are other um, uh, experiences that the world bank uh, imposes on us but anyway because of the due of time uh, we we as uh, academics uh, the law is 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 uh, set by by who by people and and uh, to serve certain interests and and, and i have many examples um, uh, to say so so we as uh, academics uh, we 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 must mobilize. We must uh, demand uh, for the implementation of law or amendment of uh, relevant laws. When we feel that laws are outdated or not implemented, we need to agree on uh, changing them. Thank you. Yes, one important point is our role. Our role as academics 
in in this sphere i i believe it's very important and i, I this is what i tried to uh, highlight in my intervention is to reconsider the way we uh, oversee things or how we construct uh, uh, or and and design uh, uh, laws and things and our interaction with students it's very important to leave and i believe this is our role as academics to uh, to uh, keep the floor open for the students to for them to open horizons uh, to uh, dig uh, in and try to explore the different potentials we in the um, uh, institute of law uh, we there are different approaches uh, in order how to tackle the law and think of it in the future such approaches uh, can contribute if uh, that the students themselves um, have the, will have the potential to make this change so this is our basic role this is our the fundamental role that things should not be addressed in the way they are now there are different perspectives that we need to uh, keep open and, and and sometimes if we don't have direct and um, um, solutions at least let's try to present a, uh, an issue in a different uh, way so that the coming generations see these issues from a, from their own perspectives we as academics we must uh, uh, set uh, step aside to give the floor to the new generation and and here i would like to say uh, the relationship between the new liberalism and and law is not only in the legislation for judiciary for instance is one of the tools uh, that uh, the new liberalism uh, work on in its relationship with the law of the statutes and the uh, legal uh, inst institutions so it is just the reform of judiciary in order to enable it to be able to uh, address the political issues in a legal way. And this is one of the tools, as I said, whereby uh, any uh, um, political issue would be controlled. So uh, what anything could be uh, uh, transformed into being legal. So any uh, any uh, uh, decision that uh, would be uh, taken would be taken by uh, uh, qualified legal persons and will take the decisions accordingly. And if we've noted in the Palestinian judiciary, uh, up till now, there are many issues related to uh, strikes, to how to how they were handled and how were discussed through uh, legal classifications and they are uh, political so so it's very important we as academics to highlight uh, these different equations and these uh, ways in order how to address the law i think i believe this is our role and we've we've played different roles in the uh, the law uh, uh, institute thank you very much I, I do agree with uh, uh, Reem, and I would like to add uh, one point. Uh, there is a, uh, we as, as legal persons, we sometimes address the law as a, it's a field by itself without interactions with other fields. And, and, and I think if we're able to uh, look at the law from a different perspective, how it intersects with the psychology, with sociology and so on, uh, maybe our view to the law and statutes would be different. We will have some revolutionary uh, way of thinking in order to uh, come up with new perspectives. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, it, it could be mainstreamed um, the, to the other faculty. With this, we'll, uh, uh, we'll be done with the last session and now we'll listen to the final uh, uh, observations and comments from um, Dr. Mudar and Gilbert Ashkar. Thank you very much uh, for being with us in this session. Yes. So good evening. We can hear, I can hear him very well.
Mm. So, uh, good evening. So I was uh, negotiating with uh, Gilbert to uh, have an input in this the conference. So he said, I will uh, comment. And, uh, and I said, but we usually in uh, uh, Morton's conference, usually uh, we have intense uh, sessions. So we, we thought uh, to uh, comment and, and uh, Gilbert wasn't able to be with us in all the sessions due to his work in, in London. So we've agreed that I would... Um, I would uh, just give a summary about uh, uh, just a brief summary of the conference. Uh, and then we'll listen to Gilbert. Um, because you you were here with us and uh, we've uh, it's not it hasn't been a year since the last uh, conference so I will not uh, repeat what uh, was uh, said during the past two days but we're going to summarize. And and I might want to raise some points, a point or two, from each of the interventions that I believe uh, were the closest to the goal. However, I will try to uh, uh, look for something between the lines that was not said in each of these sessions. What uh, motivated me to look for what's between the lines is a nice feeling. Uh, but, uh, however, a strange feeling that I felt during the introductory session, because this session, this uh, conference, it's not, it's uh, this conference, although it's not the first time, and then this tradition, uh, traditionally it used to always take place in, in this uh, hall, this very hall, that, that, that um, this, uh, to start criticizing the conference before the speakers, that this is something new. And if you remember, there were comments about the methodological um, paper and, and the abstract. And uh, I think part of uh, these comments was important, but let me remind of some, a few of the things that were said. Uh, first, uh, the importance of uh, criticizing uh, the uh, political economy uh, concept, and I can add here, uh, criticizing uh, this, uh, the Marx uh, abstract, how can we understand it, the political economy, and what do we do with it? Um, and, and the uh, importance of uh, looking back to history. Although, uh, to my belief, uh, I don't know, if, uh, Gilbert, were you with us in, uh, when uh, Pshkar uh gave his introductory speech? No, I've, I've started with Tarek Dana in the first session. Okay. So... Um, so Pshara Dumani said, is it a uh, university president? He said that as if uh, things uh, have been tackled or addressed uh, since Oslo, as if Oslo, Oslo uh, is as if in this discourse, Oslo is, the, is a central point, as if it is the starting point. And he's uh, reminded us that the topics that we're discussing, anything related to political economy, and, um, and it's not uh, have a, a, a long history, uh, so what is called the 20th century history, especially in, in the before and, and after the World War II. But specifically, all uh, what was after the uh, World War I uh, uh, have things to do with Palestinian people and need to be discussed. And, and that, so there's this historical context. However, there's, um, uh, there's a necessity to expand the uh, geographical um, uh, economy, which is not only as if uh, 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 dealing with Palestine as if it's a peninsula outside the world. I uh, I do understand uh, his point, but I really uh, feel um, um, I feel that this solution is uh, is is strange to me, and I feel this is as if we're narrowing the context and not expanding it. If if not. Uh, it in, or if, if it's not even uh, 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 limiting it as if it's amputating it. It's like an ethnic or a, a standard or a ethnic standard. Or, and I'm not sure then that it will still remain a political economy. Maybe it is important, but, but this needs to be discussed. And, 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 
Uh, so and uh, let's let me move uh, to some of the main points in order not to take more time and i will try to uh, add too much uh, uh, more points um Tari Dana's, uh lecture uh, yesterday in the first session uh, uh they were focused on an, a very important topic uh, that that it's very important for us to understand it's how uh, uh, can we have an interest how can an interest be created under occupation and one of the main uh, 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 reasons were the system of uh, um, uh, weapons industry and whether it was physical or in we mean te technology or software so there is this station attempts by Palestinians to be part of uh, this process. And there was an Israeli public plan, not a secret one, like what is happening in the West Bank to be the economic bridge between Israel and the Arab world that was boycotting Israel. So the Palestinians will be promoting the Israeli security uh, commodity. There is another part that has to do with the uh, labor force. In this discussion, I add the discussion by the speaker after Tarek Lamis. Lamis was speaking about the income from where it comes and who controls it. So income has a tool of control. And she divided that with the risk into three types. Those who work in Israel, mainly in the settlements, you know, there is no one who works in the settlements without getting a permit to enter, which is a security one, which has certain criteria, which people are not proud of. And those who work with internationally funded NGOs, neoliberalism and those who work with the PA that has its own agenda. But I didn't understand. Lamis is not here, but her sister is here. I'll allow myself to joke with her as if she is here. This is as if you are differentiating between thugs in Ramallah and thugs in Nablus why the private sector is not added uh, to the same group. I believe Lemis has reasons. The question is, are these reasons enough to split this employment and uh, capitalism into parts? And as I remember, I mean, this is an important question. Like, if we go to next paper that spoke of the Palestinian capital market and how this uh, overlaps with the policies of the PLO, we need to understand if the Palestinian uh, capital is one interest or more than one. In the past, the discussion, um, discussions uh, for my age are uh, used to call me Comrador. That is the locals who work for the interests, for non-national uh, uh, interests. And this is clear that it still exists on our territory and our land. And the role is still there. We can make this differentiation and if it is necessary or not, and are we still speaking of the uh, or is it our issue with the uh, neoliberalism and as if we are having illusions about having national capital 
But this question has always been there. Tariq Sadiq made a good intervention, but I need to combine this with Lamis. Because that is a major project that's being developed in my mind. Tariq described the Israeli economy as not a, a, an economic strategy, but a number of tactics and policies that aim at uh, displacing the Palestinians to keep them away from work and hope. But I felt as if we are speaking of uh, uh, a colonialist project without a colonialist objective, an objective that came by coincidence. I believe, out of what Tariq mentioned, and Tariq Dana, and Tariq Saad, this leads me to the question. Why did they speak about settlement colonialism? And their conclusions make us ask how far there is a need to use the concept. And speaking of colonialism in its traditional classical way, of if it really needs an additional thing colonialism to be a colonialist settlement since there are markets, there are uh, revenues from the land and there is an economic feasibility for settlement and if you continue with the sessions you will see the same thing, the Palestinian people are being commodified and, and the territories and so forth so what is it that this idea adds to it I think this thing has taken more uh, uh, diagnosis than it deserves. The discussion later on has in, has in Basim's paper on corruption, the content is similar to the question, is the Palestinian authority in its structure? Is it a local convert to like the Palestinian look? Or I provided a good intervention to remind you on this complicated network. He brought the example of Islamic Brotherhood and political Islam, but these are not the only guys working in this. He described schools and kindergartens, education, job opportunities, and many things. To me, it seemed while listening as if I am listening to the issue of immigration to Palestine. The Jews who came under the slogan of building a homeland and prepared all the infrastructure that is needed for others. And here, the question that he did not answer. 
is does this prepare an infrastructure for whom? This fits with the discussion that Jamil Harb mentioned because at the end of the day there are there is land that is not cultivated and why it's not cultivated how much capital is needed uh, do we have enough water and so many points but I'm trying to think the other way around but if there is no occupation and if we hire 330,000 people in uh, uh, agriculture and and this way this is greater than the Palestinian unemployment then they will be uh, in need to import uh, uh, workers this economy does it solve the problem or what we need to see where are these investments or how much investments are needed and can this be good without a central policy or we need still need a central policy and how much this policy is similar to the uh, uh, the uh, open market or whatever other markets to be used as Jamil mentioned we need to start planting avocados as he said also there is a criticism that I wanted to mention you know we discussed uh, the paper before the funds are used like we have loans and others work a complete system complete regime or to find people at the Al Manara uh, throwing stones it's known uh, that this is not the way that people work or maybe people still worked hard to have ownership for the land what do you want are you going to give us uh, ownership for our future or land to be owned in the future or what and the question all these debts where are they taking us and what hegemony that we are going to be subjugated to the situation I am really astonished that not only getting back to what Bishara mentioned and not only that policies did not start look you are giving credit more than uh, to Salam Fayyad. This is not, this is a new liberal invention. So you are giving much credit uh, uh, to Salam Fayyad. It is a product of a new liberal time in the world on how connecting liberation with the foreign investment and uh, uh, immigration of funds and so forth and why these ideas that were behind establishing certain things in BZ and what it should have said in early 90s and you know this is not a conspiracy most of us participated or shared some of this mirage or these hopes hoping that if there is investment we need to get share but this is not what happened. Same thing with uh, Nisaf and 
Asaf uh, made an important uh, question. Whenever we feel that the Arab countries are normalizing, I didn't hear anyone asking what their people are doing or speaking of the national state alone as if uh, uh, nations are not part of the problem that we are discussing. The formation of the Palestinian struggle. I was waiting to speak about it. There was that uh, interview with David Harvey saying, we don't know why the resistance is failing to or the uh, globalization is failing. Sometimes the resistance and the resisted are there and the structure, their structure is not clear. Then you stop having a clear objective. This is related to how the scholars in the Palestinian liberation struggle are set aside. And the intervention We went to occupy uh, with it, uh, this movement. People went for to struggle against the symbol and not the, the thing itself. What is Wall Street? Wall Street is a building, and it has uh, staff. But uh, the money owners don't uh, work there. It's only the staff who works there, and the strugglers, those who want to, to express. In one way or another, there's a question about the importance of this uh, case, uh, so that we can uh, use it in the law, work uh, step by step uh, regarding the laws in their legal framework, etc. The main question remains, uh, just to cut the story short, uh, not of course uh, repeat uh, the last uh, session, um, and only one important point uh, though, that I would like to keep in mind, the legal instruments locally like the social security and uh, the, at the international level like the ICJ these instruments work within uh, the uh, jurisdiction if I go back to Ahud's question is it possible that we work towards using this jurisdiction or against the sovereignty, maybe we need to clarify the ambiguity uh, about what is called the international juris jurisdiction, who is the sovereign, who is the sovereign party in this uh, sovereignty that produces the ju this jurisdiction. I, uh, this is enough. I try to remind you of some of the ideas and uh, to bring uh, up uh, more uh, questions, Gilbert. I think you explain things in a very in a way that encourages uh, all those who are following uh, this uh, conference on YouTube, if we start uh, with your comment, comments, this would encourage them to uh, watch all the uh, webinar. First, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to take part uh, Mm -hmm. 
to take part in, uh, those, in such uh, events? My comment is not uh, on papers, but uh, rather I would comment on the general idea based on the title of this conference and as a continuation to what you have just explained in your comment on the conference papers. I, I believe the initiative to, to organize this uh, conference under uh, political economy and you explained that this uh, uh, topic uh, raised many discussions even before the conference. I think this is an excellent initiative. The political economy of hegemony and liberation in Palestine, this title or this topic is very important and essential. We need to continue to think about it. I believe uh, uh, these two days' uh, sessions only indicate the uh, significance of things that can be listed under such titles. Yeah. Many, they are many, they are very basic, and they are essential, and there are other things that can also be uh, incorporated in these topics. And uh, we need to uh, discuss them or to uh, look into them. Uh, the, the, this expression, uh, political economy, as you said, this expression has been there since a long time as a definition, as a left-wing definition confronting the right-wing definition. We're talking about uh, economic sciences, uh, concepts, a technocrat technocratic uh, concept uh, for the sake of the economy. So the economy is uh, or techn te technocracy is uh, something that should be addressed by the specialists or or the experts and it does not have to do with the uh, politics. This is a general concept. You have to separate economy from politics. Of course, this is a very uh, illusory uh, conception of the leftists uh, in the academia and in the cultural uh, aspect, we insist to call it uh, the political economy. Uh, even though you uh, mentioned the subtitle of the capital of Marx is a criticism into political uh, economy that was uh, uh, monopolizing at his time and not rejecting the concept of the uh, uh, political economy. Therefore, the use of the, uh, the use by the leftists and the Marxists in English, you find the academia and the Marxists are the first to insist to use this concept, this political economy concept, to emphasize that you cannot, you can never separate uh, economy from uh, politics. Economy uh, in, is uh, general. It is political with our excellence. This leads us to the idea, to a famous idea or a famous say by Lenin in this respect, the founder of the, or the leader of the Russian revolution, when he said that, when he described politics as an intensified expression, politics is an is an extensive or an intensified expression from economy. If we start to look into the political uh, economy of hegemony, since we're talking about this, if we start with the political economy of the hegemony within the Palestinian framework, from this perspective, we are compelled to look into the politics itself in light of the war 
This takes us to another famous idea or notion the, of the Russian strategic general that politics, that war is a continuation of, the, of politics using other uh, uh, means. So we can uh, gather these two uh, topics or these two uh, ideas, uh, uh, politics as uh, and the war as a continuation of politics using other methods or means based on that if we look into the issue of hegemony in Palestine and Zionism Zionism forces itself on the analyst or the observer described as a, pro as a colonial project, an occupy occupying a project, especially since it, was, it, uh, it started uh, uh, to be applied in Palestine. It's a project based on war. It's based on violence. It's a project that cannot be separated from the violence, means of violence that are essential in for, to implement this project. Within this context, the Palestinian context, we find that the Zionist economy is, is, an, ex, is a, a, an intensified or focused expression from the politics that is a continuation of war. So it's completely the opposite. The Zionist economy becomes uh, has has the purpose to support the violent the violence uh, uh, project or war, which is a continuation of the settler uh, policies. That we, uh, we all of us are aware of. So it was only uh, appropriate that the first paper in this uh, conference was Tarek's about uh, the colonial settlement uh, uh, is the, the, the essence of the whole conference, the security, uh, the military security production, which is uh, the Zionist production based on the Zionist policies, which is a continuation of the war project. And or the violence uh, project. It ref um, other uh, other interventions reflected this also. Going to the second part of this title and topics and papers of the conference, the uh, political science for uh, emancipation or the liberation in Palestine based on the analysis of the nature of the politic of the uh, Zionist uh, uh, project, the liberation, the Palestinian liberation project since a long time we, we are aware that uh, there, there's so much discussion about uh, the equation of the, the liberation of the land and the liberation of uh, the human being. Many discussions uh, took place, especially after the launch of the uh, renewed Palestinian uh, resilience uh, uh, post-1967 war. At the beginning, the, the, the concept by the Palestinian uh, uh, resilience uh, factions, uh, this concept was, or it, this concept wants the liberation of land As, as a condition, as a precondition to liberate uh, uh, humans. So if the liberation of the human being or the liberation of man is similar to the emancipation of uh, women, the liberation of land as a precondition, was a precondition to liberate man. The policies in this respect becomes a continuation of the war and the economy is a, a war economy or an economy that becomes a resilience economy 
or maybe the funding process of the uh, or funding the uh, the resilience the resilience of course the armed groups and factions uh, the historical experience they proved that this is only an illusion the illusion of uh, uh, preceding the, the the liberation of land to the liberation of men this was a failure historically speaking i i think it is uh, it has become clear that you have to liberate men prior to liberating land and for the sake of liberating land meaning the palestinian community has to be liberated in order to for the palestinian people or the palestinian society to liberate their land I think this is what the historical experience uh, proves clearly. And so the equation, the liberation, the Palestinian liberation equation, in my uh, own perspective, must make the politics conquer, regardless whether it is an emancipatory uh, politics or all, all types of uh, liberation, whether social, economic, gender, uh, emancipation, anything, all types of, uh, uh, of emancipation must go above the war and should come back within the Palestinian uh, uh, liberation that should go back to its uh, natural, uh, uh, natural order because as opposed to the Zionist, because the Zionist is the ex exception. The Zionist is the exception, and it's the continuation, the politics continuing the war, and uh, not, vice, and not uh, the opposite. Using other uh, uh, tools, uh, depending uh, or, or as necessary, and not to describe the war as an initial principle as it used to be in the past, based on the illusion that the war is able to, to lead to the liberation of land. So the ability to liberate land uh, using uh, weapons. Whoever believes that the war, uh, that uh, the land could be liberated within the Palestinian framework using weapons, this is an illusion. Uh, the war here should be a continuation of the policy, of the politics using other a means as necessary and not the main uh, uh, tool or uh, means as it used to be in the past, uh, especially during the 1967 war. This, and this is my uh, uh, final conclusion. There has to be a political strategy, uh, an emancipatory political strategy based on the diagnosis of the powers, of the balance of powers and through the unification of the Palestinian struggle and providing their economic resilience, including or the economic steadfastness, which includes struggle against the corrupt uh, authority, as some papers uh, said, the uh, corrupt uh, authority that uh, uh, appeared under the occupation. So an eman emancipatory political Political strategy based on the balance of powers through the unification of the Palestinian struggles and providing the uh, conditions uh, or requirements of their uh, uh, economic uh, uh, steadfastness on one hand and, the, and on, on the other uh, weakening the Zionist state from both economic and this is the uh, BDS uh, role. Here comes the BDS role, which is uh, also important. And weakening the, the Zionist state from uh, a, a political perspective and uh, through increasing or escalating the international pressure against Israeli, uh, the Israeli aggression or the Israeli aggressiveness. This pressure should, uh, it should, be, should focus on the Israeli uh, uh, aggressiveness 
uh, and not as opposed to the uh, Zionist uh, performance as a project. It has not reached that level yet, but at least to have this kind of pressure exerted against uh, or exerted on the aggressiveness of the Israeli state, which is very helpful within the Palestinian uh, and emancipatory framework. These, uh, these were my, uh, my comments based on, on the title of this conference. Thank you so much, Gilbert. I forgot to say that Gilbert is uh, Tarek, uh, Tarek's uh, uh, teacher, but I feel jealous. He, my, the prof professor doesn't sit with me in the same conference. Thank you so much. I believe uh, this kind of discussion, as Gilbert said, is is one that I never came to my mind uh, to be able to uh, come up uh, with uh, a conclusion. Uh, there is a clear recommendation for Fatah and the Popular Front uh, and to Hamas and to whoever you want. Whoever wants to be liberated is the Palestinian uh, human being. It's not the building of a state or the liberation of the land. If you have a different uh, background, you might uh, disagree with Gilbert, but I think we're in a, a position where those or the politicians or those who work in politics should uh, either adopt this uh, position or maybe at least say why they should disagree. I think it's based on uh, foundations and uh, puts the, the sets the priority what serves who or who serves what, uh, which is the, uh, the, the the liberation methodology cannot be the methodology of the colonialism. So there are steps to be taken. What leads to what leads to what, and how can we uh, start uh, dismantling uh, the same thing? Or maybe we need to to further speak uh, on that. Uh, just uh, a quote by Marx about uh, the importance of uh, the change of the methodology based on the objective, the objective or the goal that uh, sets uh, the motivations to check to check the uh, the main objective of freedom or the which makes us uh, look into the liberation as opposed to uh, the hegemony uh, or or fighting or or confronting the hegemony. It's not uh, to uh, fight Israel, but rather to get rid of the Zionist project. I believe it's, oh, well, it's after five. I would like to thank everyone for your patience all these hours of the two days. I thank you for your attendance. I think there have been some sound uh, problems uh, on YouTube or They're changing uh, the uh, sound uh, issues on YouTube. Uh, maybe by tomorrow it will be fixed. Gilbert, if you have uh, some time, uh, a written question. The liberation of man. Is there a special role uh, of the universities that, or a special role that universities should take or play? Yes, universities uh, are uh, part of uh, the so-called the state ideological uh, regime. One of the objectives of building them is to build the state, but or to serve the state. But the nature of these universities, we the criticism is the cornerstone in thinking and science, and so it continuously 
turns universities into uh, centers for criticism, where the critical thinking they learn is nurtured and universities, not only uh, universities uh, as institutions for uh, liberation, but there is a space for the development of uh, critical thinking. I think You know, this question that keeps repeating, who teaches the teacher and who uh, liberates the liberator? The university graduates and the knowledge produced there. If it's not laboratory one or emancipatory one, we cannot build that capacity. So what should be done at the universities in order to produce that power? And the answer, you know it, this conference is part of that, and you are soldiers or officers, part of the force that leads this. There is no hope, no alternative, but to keep being critical, and because we are facing a very complicated project, but it's a project that cannot work without us. It is there to uh, control us. And the university, like any tool, it can be uh, either it can be oppressive, it can be supportive for the critical thinking. It is, this university is the one that graduated the revolutionary leaderships in Palestine. And as uh, instead of what happened like in uh, what happened in Gaza. I think we need to conclude here. We have taken much of your time, but I didn't see any of you uh, closing their purses or collecting your papers. Thank you, Gilbert. Thank you. And thanks for the audience. See you uh, next conference. But I think there will be other conferences other than the uh, annual one. The other year there was the joint one with the Studies Institute and the one with the California University. It was a nice conference. It, it was the uh, birthday of Marx, I believe, and so forth. But I in fall, we have activity. It was the beginning of discussion, but it did not last. It is along with our new university president to bring his annual conference in Brown to be uh, on a new studies on the Palestinian studies. I don't know if this is going to succeed or not. Anyway, you receive invitations. Morton's uh, conference is richer day before, yesterday before the conference. 12 interventions were produced as alphabets for Palestinian liberation. I was waiting for them. One of the people was waiting for them when they are going to make their inputs is Gilbert. Yes, I think we can convince him to do something in this regard. You will see it on the website. As I understood, at a man they are thinking of launching the book on a political corruption. And we told them, you are experts of corruption, so it's better you do that, not us. <clears throat> so you receive invitations for all of that. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for Northern's team. I must confess that this year, I worked a 
we little for the success of the conference, unlike all patriarchs, I'm very proud that it succeeded without me. Very proud. I must say that this means that, that there are others who work a lot at the institute, outside, around the institute, the guards, the staff, the cafeteria, and the, the translators.